didn't realize it. Yeah, um, I thought you were almost doing stuff like constantly. It's been this year, yeah, for the last year, it's been constantly, and then it was like a year and a half in between. So, so it's been, it's been my project usually six, eight months to a year, and then it's like a year, year and a half, and then it comes again. So this has been a goal for this year. It wasn't really intended to, but it just became that way. So next year will probably not be that much. Well, hopefully we'll things don't get changed again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, but then he will hopefully come back again in 22. I told Wolfgang that next year we can take a break and then come back because he, he does not do setting projects every year. So he kind of oh, okay. that. So, so that's something. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Scott, can you hear us, Wiley? Yes, we can. It's funny. The vacuum cleaner stopped in the middle of the floor, so he gave up. <laughs> <laughs> I was stuck. No, it, apparently not. It's it's a hard floor in the, the hallway next to the door, but he just gave up in the middle of it. So that, but that's good. Yep, I closed it's the door. It's a quitter. So. It's a quitter vacuum cleaner. Yep. Oh. At times it gives up and 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 reports some error message of some sort. So, yeah. But it just huh. gives up. So that, that, that's good. here hey Gary hey Gary um, no Wolfgang yet Gary so um, we're hoping Wolfgang hops on any minute now so uh, uh, you may get drafted <laughs> Uh, it's not, I'll get all these preludes, man, I got, especially when I got that almost a three minute long ad now, right? So, which yeah. I'm not complaining about, it's awesome. Yeah, there's so, so many cool sponsors that they yeah. Be fine. Boom.
It is. It is six minutes before. Yeah. You're not too late, Big Mac. You're never too late. Oh, I feel bad. Well, well, we'll see. Max stayed up. Yeah, I'm amazed they stay up. Stay up. Stay up. Well, I was skagging this one. He goes, oh, it's 3.30 here. Uh, I'm going to go to sleep now. I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah it, it is too late to break by now. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so, uh, two big giveaways for uh, Infinite Dimensions Tuesday night's game. Now, remember, we normally don't play Tuesday. We usually play Thursday. But with Thanksgiving, we're playing... Playing uh, Sean Reynolds, crossbows, crossbows. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that was like that. I, I mean, I didn't know any of that background story. That, that, that is. Then again, we find out some really nut, nutty stuff. I and mean, we found out, we found out on Wednesday night that, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, the night uh, the week before, from uh, we found out that. Uh, the entire, uh, the entirety of the ethereal invasion thing was done over uh, everyone uh, over gold slaughter. So, um, you know, you find these things out, you're like, wow. So, and the and, uh, and the and the Western map was done over a weekend just to, to fill content. They needed space in and, and one of the mag the, the magazine. So, uh, yep, really cool. <laughs> so we can't put too. We put more into the discussion of analyzing than they ever did. Yeah, they're just like, well, we gotta do this. So, yeah. uh, I will, Big Mac. I will if if we get him on. He's not on right now. It hasn't hooked up yet. So, uh, well, I'm wishful. I'm wishful thinking here. Yeah. Hang on a second. I'll I'll make sure we ping him up if you can. Uh, email yep. wise, I'm, yep. uh, maybe we he got do. stuck somewhere or something. Yep. And I will say thanks for that too. So, uh, but I'm going to make it worth your while for coming on, no matter what, everyone. I'm prepared. I'm prepared with something. So, uh, of course, now I'm not prepared for the next button to hit. What's up, Tim? Okay, yeah, Wolfgang confirmed multiple times during the week, but the last confirm I got was Wednesday, and then I talked to him last on Thursday, so. Yep, see, yep. <coughs> Wait a minute, was that you? That was, that was me. Okay. I, I see, see you on the message I just got. I'll just I'll throw a carrot out there. So <laughs> I'll throw I got a I got a couple carrots to throw courtesy of uh, mostly uh, Canadian Ancient Gamer Patrick. I got some nice carrots here. <laughs> so you're all gonna get some carrots here. Well two of you. I'll save the entry screen for Wolfgang. If he hops on, we'll hop to it real quick. So I'll save his entry screen. How's that sound? All right, so this is a first. This is a first. Well, actually, Luke was on late uh, once or twice, too. So, yeah. uh, good evening. I'm Jay Kalurgas. I got Anna Meyer with me tonight, and we're ready to interview Wolfgang. Oh, so we're, we're still waiting. Yeah, we're uh, still waiting. We'll still see. waiting. So, we'll see what happens. Um, he yep. did confirm. So, yep. um, you know, if he's running late or there's an issue, we'll, we'll find out shortly. So, here comes my carrot to you all to hang in there as people are coming on more. So, um, We'll do we'll do some legendary wall of fame on my on my wall giveaways here. I already got the I already got the giveaway thing set up. See, I, 
I got my I have my crystal ball, I guess. Um, so these are two of the 24 modules in my Wall of Fame. One of them is an ode to our old friend Leonard. So I'm going to give away a, a Village of Hama and a Bone Hill reprint tonight. How's that sound? Oh, cool. How's that good enough there? Yeah, I got to do it off all around. I haven't done it yet. So there you go. I'm going to give away, uh, and you get your choice first winner. Get your choice if you want the Village of Hamlet reprint or the Secret of Bone Hill reprint. All right, both very nice. So let me set that up so I'll have that rolling. And uh, oh, yeah, see? You gotta, you gotta keep, you gotta keep the, uh, you gotta keep the natives happy here. You know what I mean? You gotta keep the fans yep. and, and and the crew yep. happy here. So let me set this up real quick. So hopefully everyone's doing well tonight. And in the, um, in place of while we're waiting, uh, there was uh, we had a, a really good talk on, uh, and I came in late though on a great talk on Friday night. Uh, Gary was on and. Um, DM two two one five three two and Asher was on and um, I know I'm missing people. Rich uh, Lunch Talos, Oblivion Seeker, Enoch was on. Uh, it was a good discussion while 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 I was on before I passed out um, that night. And uh, so uh, DMs was DMs like you gotta write down all your uh, you gotta write down all your rules. <laughs> it's like they are they're all in these books. Here, let me finish getting the uh, the giveaway set up first. They're all in these books, right? And uh, he's like, yeah. no, no, no. I mean, you got to get them so you can, you know, put... I was like, uh, I, I don't know if I... I mean, that's going to take like 20 years. Like, it would take you to do the entire map in super high resolution, right? Yeah, but yeah, but they want to have the, the, the first, second edition J version, so to speak. So, yeah. The Lord yeah. Gusumba rules. Yeah, the Lord Gusumba edition. The 1.70 yeah. or the 2.75 edition or, yeah. One point, one point, someone called it one point J, which I like. Uh, so yeah. uh, now type in exclamation point drawing. Hey, what's up, Rocks? Good to see you. Good to see everyone. Uh, we're, we're checking our email and hopefully uh, he either got times crossed up or he got held up somewhere. But um, we are, we're hanging in there. Please hang in and be, uh, you know, be a little patient here. Uh, well, yep. Let's see what happens. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this discussion was, was cool. And I figured, I figured why don't, uh, I, I kind of I always have this somewhere nearby. Like, um, let's talk about some uh, uh, quickie rules customizations. I think that'll be a good direction to go for the time being. Uh, and like I said, you can shoot away um, with questions. But I wanted to talk about one that there was a discussion going on. Asher was doing it. The discussion. I think it was it was actually on Greyhawk Online, uh, and uh, Gordo was talking about it. And that is. Why and, and of course Casey the min max extraordinaire you want oh look at that he's on right now Casey so here's the qu so the question is why the first one why 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 would you use a long sword when a bastard sword is better in in your game and this this just Casey just brought this up multiple times uh, as we finished the stream last night and we went on uh, all um, uh, into the today it's a good question. Um, and I have a couple answers I gave him. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Anna, what would you surmise would be, like, Bastard Sword does more damage. You can use it one-handed or two-handed. So there are some advantages to it, right? Um, yeah, you, you, you can, one that rarely comes up is the economic reason. Some weapons are way more expensive than others, but most characters very quickly become so rich that they can basically pick any normal weapon without cost. That, that's But that's one thing that should be more like it in, in if you more take it into real world economy like medieval times. If something were yeah. 100 gold pieces more expensive, it will be out of reach of half the fighter, low level fighters or or, or, or warriors or, or medieval normal people who maybe could afford a cheap sword, they couldn't afford the expensive one. Yeah, well, all, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Absolutely right on that. You're absolutely right on that. That, yeah, that best sword is not cheap. Exactly, but we, we normally the way we run games, characters very quickly become the richest in in the neighborhood, so to speak. They can basically buy any item that way. Yeah. So, uh, uh, invitations open, Gary. If you're able to hop on and uh, and participate in this discussion, uh, and, you yeah. know, yeah, you're more than welcome to hop on too, or participate out there. Either way. Uh, so, here's a couple things I'm thinking of, and uh, all right, uh, Casey knows I love him, and I'm just bashing him because it's fun, right? But you got to remember, Casey comes from the 3035 min max era, where if you went, to, you really wanted to do that. And so I understand what's play you needed too. Yeah. I understand what's going on in that head of his, you know. So um, 
And there, and there are some characters in, in in the game last night that use were using bastard sword, and I have no problem with it. But they weren't hardcore fighters anyway. So you had Inquisitor, which is a paladin. He doesn't get multiple attacks with specialization in my game. And uh, who else had the bastard sword? Oh my gosh! Someone. Else, oh man, who? Uh, my brain just shut down. Uh, I threw two characters with bastard sword last night. Oh, well, I got them right here. I'll check. Um, but, and Garn uses Bastard Sword, and I, there's a couple reasons that I, as a DM, I, I can, uh, if you have exotic feet, uh, no, see, Dead Sky, we're talking 1E, 2E here, I'm talking, yeah. J yeah. And in, in third edition, that was in 3.5, and yeah. I think even in Pathfinder, then one of the main reasons you wouldn't skip a Bastard Sword is that you, a Bastard Sword is that you have to spend a fee oh, in order to get the benefit. Yeah. Which yep. is an uh, yeah. Then you spend valuable feat resources on 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 using for oh, just that weapon. And Sawan too. So uh, also um, the uh, and she. By the way, so Eric Mengi was freaking awesome last night. All right. So he did all these great. His character Swan, especially Priestess of Mayhem, she did all these great things in the fight last yeah. night. Mm -hmm. Did not hit a single time. Not one combat <laughs> melee hit. The entire yeah. adventure, uh, yeah. it was it was unbelievable. Fumbles, yeah. the whole the whole the whole yeah. deal. It was it was it was it was unbelievably yeah. crazy. Um, yeah. But this guy has a good question there. That it, can you only use the bastard sword if, if you have the exotic feet in three point five and Pathfinder? And people in chat can correct me if I'm wrong. I think you can still use it, but in order to get the full benefit of being able to use it both one handed and two handed and get full bonus, you needed the right. feet. Otherwise, you get like it was used as a regular weapon, and if you have the feet, you can add extra strength bonus to it. And stuff. So that takes us to back a little bit. I wanted to step back and discuss old school weapon specialization, which came out yeah. on Arcana. And look, this is my. This is these are the ones that are as you can see. Uh, this is one of the ones that's behind me. This is you're allowed to pick these up and play these and 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 read these on my in the pile. And the player's handbook's pretty beat up too. Uh, the um, so that's that's this pile. It's not in the uh, other side one. So um, yeah, uh, and Dismas, there. So you're talking point five now, and you're talking you're, you're calculating it. But you got to remember in one e two e, Bastard Sword goes, does two die four, two die eight against with two handed, and we do. Strength does one and a half times damage in a two-handed weapon. So that stacks it even further. So um, Bastard Sword is kind of that hybridized weapon where you have, you can do it one-handed or two-handed, and it ran into yep. some problems. Well, everyone's going to take that. It's yep. not, it, that's not the case, because as, me as a DM can do a couple things. Here comes Wolfgang. Look at that. Oh, awesome. See, look at that. You were patient. We yep. still doing the giveaway because it's set up already. Oh yeah. You're that's still good. doing it. We're yep. still doing that giveaway. That's mm -hmm. all. That's all running. So you're good. D double. Okay. Double. Hey. Awesome. Yay. Hey folks. Hi. Welcome. Wolfgang. Good evening. Yeah, hey, I'm you. sorry. I'm running a little late. It's okay. Don't, uh, we no were... worries. We, we, we had a plan B just in case. Yeah, so we're we... chatting with the audience a little bit and yeah. just talking so some is, uh, yeah. uh, odds we and ends. Gary Hoolian's on, yeah. on, uh, in there, and he's uh, you know giving me a hard time, as usual. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Gary. <laughs> so, uh, Wolfgang, very nice to see you. Thank you yeah, for coming on. You. Ten nice. seconds. Jay was vamping. I was vamping. No, I wasn't vamping. I wasn't. Va <laughs> I was not thrommel vamping. Okay, because we, we'll talk about that. Once yeah, that, that's one of. Yeah, we, we have to tell you another story. That was. Oh, that's the, that's you, uh, Wolfgang Obubison. Is you? We had to make what? it here tonight. No, it's okay. Someone put in chat. Yeah. Um, they had yeah. to make it here. So, Thank you for coming on. Yeah. So. Uh, Jay has a couple of caveats and, and fun things you always make fun of him. And one is that, that someone made uh, Prince Thrommel of Ryundi a vampire oh, in, 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 of in Return of Tee. And, oh, and that's, oh, we always make fun oh, of Jay because he doesn't like that. So everyone yeah. makes that up. <laughs> that's one of the, the standing jokes of the channel is the Thrommel vampire from Return of the Temple of Elementary. So once again, with when I did research, um, and here's some of Wolfgang's accomplishments. When I did oh, research... Yeah, uh, oh, we got a lot more, man. Wait do you... I, I try to prepare, and I went real old school on this. Um, so, um, welcome. And Wolfgang, thank you so very much for coming on tonight. Um, of we're going to have... We're, we're going to bounce all over the place, keep it lighthearted, you know, and just this is sure. more going to be a general discussion than an interview. That's the way we've done it. Um, so, 
you have an extensive, extensive accomplishments. I kind of have linked them onto this page. They're all over the place as far as a, a, a list. So I found this list. I think Asher linked this for me. So I have some of them here. Just And then I, uh, this way I can link to your Cobalt Press later on in the discussion oh, as sure. well and pop yeah, that Cobalt's up. Yeah, Cobalt's just the last 10 years. There's a bunch of stuff before then. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's wonderful stuff too. Uh, tell us about how you went from... Like when D you went into D and D, like what were you doing? I, I, um, I found your oldest publication is nineteen ninety that I that I researched. Um, oh, there's earlier ones, but you got to dig into. Um, uh, I think you're right for nineteen ninety for my standalone titles, but before that, I published in Dungeon Magazine quite a bit. Okay, okay. and That's those one. are a little harder to find. Um, yeah. But some of the early issues of Dungeon is where I, I started as a D and D designer. Yeah, hey, Rose for Talakara was one I did. Uh, I love it. Yes. Oh, I and most of the credit goes to to Stephen Kurtz, who also did later Al Kadim work, and then sort of disappeared as a designer. But he and I uh, <sighs> game together in college for years, and Talakara was our our co writing piece uh, with the anti paladin. And oh my goodness, yes. There was a lot of goodness in that one. What a uh, so this is Dungeon Twenty Five. Let's just jump right in. This is Dungeon Twenty Five. Sure. It's not even my first one, but it's probably one of the best. It is super high level. Okay, it yes. is, and it is a great tragic story, right? Yes, and it it has some twists in it, and the 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 evil individual she's really vile <laughs> in, in, in it, and so uh, I mean, great villains are really. Uh, as a game master, you get your teeth into it, right? Somebody oh, like yeah. Strahd, um, or uh, oh, I don't know, take your favorites. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's just so much easier to run the adventure if the villain is just nasty and awful, and the players just there she hate is, them, right? Hey, yeah. yeah, there she is. Oh my <laughs> gosh, you're taking me back to 1990. It's 30 years ago, and I still remember. <laughs> some of it but if you're gonna press me on the details i might have that's to look okay away. i remember that one yeah yes. there's a skeleton where yeah yeah what a, what a wonderful i uh, trust me on this if you have a high level campaign you want to fit this in Greyhawk, it is yes. wonderful and so um not toot my own horn, Wolfgang. My campaign's been going on 40 years. Continuous. Oh, so high-level material is your jam. It's a mix. It's a mix because we have 20 different adventuring groups because I'm really crazy oh. and insane. So wow, uh, that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Rose, uh, we're on Adventure 895 this Tuesday. We have about 2,750 sessions, we uh, estimate. Rose wow. for Talakara. He logs everyone. He logs I love logged every adventure I've done. Yeah. Rose for oh, Talakara was number yes. 99. That's how old uh, long ago I did it. Wow. So yeah. even for you, it's a long time. Ago. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Not just me. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. My wonderful adventure. One of yes. my top 10 all time in dungeon. Uh, wonderful. Yeah, oh absolutely. My goodness. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. Um, well, Steve and I kind of challenged each other to do better. We traded off sections. We read each other's parts and corrected them. So it was one of those design collaborations. Um, where we kind of got each other because we've been playing together in the same campaign for years. Uh, he ran Spelljammer for me. I ran some Al Kadim for him. This was the era of, you know, it was still uh, second edition. That's what we were playing at the time. Yeah. So that's how long ago it was. Yeah. Um, but my first credits were actually in first edition. I think I had something in like Dungeon 7 or. Really? 15. Okay. Yeah, the Fire Giant's Daughter is a very short piece, and then there's yep. something called the Ship of Night, which is a bunch of crazy Darrow doing yeah. something pretty nutty uh, underground. And the funny thing is, some of those themes from way back when, um, like the Ship of Night and the, the crazy Darrow, it's like, I just recently published the fifth edition version of Empire of the Ghouls, and what do you know, there's Darrow in there. Um, there's Darrow in the monster manual we just put out, right? So Wolfgang, we got to talk about that because Kingdom of the Ghouls is yes. is the number, th it, 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 and we got to talk about this too. The best, uh, the best thirty all time modules, and then there's oh, okay. a little ode to that in that article that you and Gary participated in in, in Dungeon right. where you picked it out. And Kingdom of the Ghouls is ranked third of all time I know. in that list. And I wrote that at a really dark time in my life. Right? Like, <laughs> No, seriously, I was, that was 1990, 
five. TSR had been circling the drain for some time, so I took a job at Wizards of the Coast. I left the magazines I loved. I stopped working on Dragon. I mean, I was editor at Dragon Magazine, and I left, right? Yeah. Oh, like, so I yeah. felt the odds. Oh, my, that Brom cover, I think, is a big part of the reason. That's a favorite <laughs> adventure from Dungeon. Yeah. Brom's cover is amazing. But, yes, I moved out to Seattle. I was working for Wizards of the Coast. The whole company was super thrilled about Magic the Gathering, which was doing so well. But they also had a role-playing division uh, because Peter Atkinson, of course, started it as a, an RPG company. Yeah. And so I was an early hire. Before they bought out TSR, I showed up there. But I didn't know anybody, right? Like, I literally had no friends, no connections. And the way stuff was done for Magic was so different from the way stuff was done back at TSR. It was a... I was a square Midwestern kid and there were a bunch of cool goths doing, you know, magic art and selling billions of boxes of cards every day. And I was like, why am I even here? So I wrote Kingdom of the Ghouls because I had a lot of angst. And <laughs> I said, let's go into the Underdark. You made good use Dora of the Doris yes. There he is. There's a picture right there. There he yeah. is. Doris Sane yeah. made reappearances in 4th edition, I know for sure. Uh -huh. And maybe more recently, I'm not 100% sure where else he's been picked up. And then, of course, in 5th edition, Kingdom of the Ghouls became Empire of the Ghouls by Cobalt Press. Because yeah. I was like, yeah, the idea of an underground kingdom of undead is not... It's too good to, to It's hold. too good to Nuggets. leave it by the wayside, yeah. yeah. And the Cobalt Press version of it, of course, is a 300-page adventure path from, like, levels 1 to 10. All right. Yes, so, that so. was I, kind of last year's big hit, I think. It or, was. Yeah. It was came out in, oh, I want to say it two was years like ago, was March. It? No, no, it was no, a it's Kickstarter year. two years ago, and oh, it shipped yeah. in March. Okay, yeah. I am looking on the site Beautiful. to try and get it there as quickly as possible. So Yeah, so um, Empire of the Ghouls. Oh, the nice thing about Empire of the Ghouls, of course, is it also comes with an Underworld Player's Guide. So there are Mushroom People. There we go. There's oh, Playable yeah. Darrow. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. That I mean, that's the adventure you're looking at right there, which Richard Green led the design on it. Um but Mike Wellam and Kelly Pollock did such great work. Uh, it's a wonderful adventure. And it got, where was it? Oh, the Tome Show. The Tome Show did a rating of what are your favorite fifth edition adventures for D&D? Yeah. And Empire of the Ghouls came in like third or fourth as a write-in. Nice. Like it's Curse of Strahd, Tomb of Annihilation, Empire of the Ghouls. I'm like, are you serious? It's a write-in? And they're like, yeah, we got... Hundreds and hundreds of votes, a thousand votes. I don't know. You guys made it as a write-in for Empire of the Ghouls. And wow. so awesome. I was really thrilled. Um, because, yeah, you can trace the lineage back in some ways, right, to, to something I wrote in a very dark winter. Pretty lonely, just designing my heart out uh, that winter in Seattle. Part of the reason I was so bummed and writing a, a very dark underworld adventure was Seattle in winter. Yeah, like it can be. Yeah. The sun sets at four. <laughs> it doesn't come up till nine the next morning, right? Like it's dark and gray and rainy. And I wasn't used to the climate and the darkness. I think uh, the gloom sank into the manuscript is what happened. Yeah. Well, uh, yep. we, we all get there occasionally, you know, playing yeah. it for so long. And sometimes our, our D, uh, I imagine when you DM, you have good nights and bad nights and, and, and yeah. fun nights and gloomy nights. So I, I can understand well, funny, that. Right. The funny thing is some of the gloomy stuff was like pretty good for me creatively. Right. Like I go back and I look at it and I say, yeah, I was not a happy person, but I was pouring all my creative energy into something that I yeah. felt good about. Yeah. 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 Um, and that worked. And then, of course, you know, Roger Moore and the rest of the gang at Dungeon edited it into shape. And that Brom cover, I just can't say enough good things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it just, it came right to me. Uh, Kingdom of the Ghouls for me, number 479. Aha! Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so we're moving up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So by that point, you must have taken it out of second edition and into... 
third? No, I no, still play one e two e to this day. Yeah, oh, you still he, play one e two e? Exactly. So yeah, so he kind of uh, house ruled his own one e two e. Yeah, I've in, I've incorporated yeah. feats into my proficiency systems, and we have approval yeah. feats, you know, and expanded yeah. the proficiency system and yeah. some good right. spells in. But yeah, it's uh, it's like a two point seventy five version. Yeah. Right. Oh no, I mean any campaign that runs yeah. that long, I'm sure you've got some fun house rules and yep. some things that you you like or don't like. Uh, it's one of the nice things about a really long running campaign is like the players uh, occasionally ask you for stuff that, that inspires you to, to tweak it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you don't listen to your players, you're not going to have players. You know, you ha yeah. it's part of the game. You need to grow with my friends. I've been playing with the one for 42 years and yeah. we have like 50 ca character classes and 45 specialty priests made up. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, ex evolve with them. And that's a great thing about D and D it's, it's, that's capabilities yeah. to do that. Oh, yeah. So what do you think? Do you think that that is kind of, now with this Tasha book, I'm going to hop ahead. You think that's kind yeah, of sure. gone away a little bit with, the, the, a lot of people don't realize, oh my God, I can edit all this, you know, because it's so yeah. popular now. Well, I think when you're new to the game, I know I was this way. When I was new to d and I wanted to know how it worked and I wanted to do it right, right? Like I wanted to yeah. understand how it all hung together and I wanted to present it fairly for my players and I didn't feel confident enough uh, for me. I was whatever, 12, 13. I, I didn't feel confident enough, even with my buddies who were my players to wing it. Right. Like that took a couple of years maybe before I started yeah. really creating a bunch of new stuff. Yep. But once yep. I started, there's no stopping. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you but mean I like, yeah. You have to know the rules before you can break them, so to speak. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing we're seeing today, right? Like okay. there's a new generation that's new to the game. You wait a year or two after they've hit it, right? And then they're like, well, I think I can tweak this in a way that will satisfy me and my players, yeah. right? Even though there's a lot of good material out there, um, I, I hope and I think that most people who play at some level want to make it their own story, their own character and bring... Uh, bring something new to the table that makes it their game. Yeah. I've always loved homebrews better than store bought, which is a weird really? thing. <laughs> yeah, which is a weird thing to admit as a D and D <laughs> adventure writer okay. and publisher. And uh, you're uh, Wolfgang. You've done almost every setting, right? Except oh, for yeah. Dragonlance, maybe. Yeah. I okay. haven't done Dragonlance, right. but I've done yeah, Birthright and Eberron and. Ravenloft and Greyhawk and the realms and Planescape, okay, I didn't do Planescape oh. lots of Planescape and Alcadim yeah. and no, um, uh, did I do Spelljammer? I don't think I've done any official yeah. Spelljammer. Okay, because uh, Big, Big Mac from the Piazza asked a question yeah. of you. Please sure. ask Wolfgang if he has details of his Spelljammer PC anywhere. I don't know. Oh that. gosh, I wish. No, I, I there's a there's a box somewhere in the garage <laughs> that might have a folder full of characters. But as I remember, well, Steve Kurtz, the the guy from Rose from Talakar, uh, he he may have kept character seats between sessions. I don't know. It's been a while. What I can tell you, I found recently is I found my old letters to Sage Advice. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, yep. Or rather, I found the responses I got from Skip Williams. <laughs> because I mailed in letters. Same here. One. And, yeah, once in a while, they, you know, he would pull one or do something with But most of them, he's like, nah, I've already answered that. Or, you know, not an interesting question. But he would write back sometimes just to write back. Um, and he kept a bunch of them my originals in a filing cabinet, which he gave to me when I showed up at TSR. He's like, oh, you, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, crap, Skip Williams knows who I am and has saved every fan letter I've ever sent him about, like, please explain <laughs> alignment to me, right? <laughs> and I, I found, I moved houses recently and I found this box of letters from Sage Advice. And I'm sort of torn between, I should post these online and yeah, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> it is. Um, 
That's yeah, we cool. Had him on, we had Skip Williams on a couple like a weeks ago of, on yeah, uh, Legends ago, of War, and, and he he talked he talked about all that he actually sat down and that was a big part of his work and it, and, and he was kind of it, it was, it was. he goes you're yeah. paying me by the letter, by each one I answer so he did them yeah. all <laughs> every single he answered them all. I yeah, thought so, he was just the greatest guy because it was the only yeah, way to get so an answer. Said, yeah, so he said that he, that was a major part of his work to, to actually uh, answer them and that, because it was before the internet. All right, so it was it before the internet and yeah. he yeah. was a he was a young guy when he started. Like I think he started well, you probably had all this on your last show, but or on that previous yeah. show. But he he started early and he was a rules authority for decades. Yeah. And yeah. I was thrilled every time I got an answer from him. But, you know, I was writing him letters at 13, 14, 15 yeah. years of age. They weren't always good questions, but he was very patient about it. Do you yeah, remember yeah. one Tell that sticks question. out? One that sticks I, out? The one that sticks out for me that I'm embarrassed about now is the alignment question. Where I'm like, I don't think your alignment system makes that much sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I still, I'm like, yeah, that's not the best part of the game, but it's very D&D. Um, he he wrote back a nice answer, right? Like, well, this is how you use it, and this is what's in the rules, and this is, you know, you you don't have to run it this way, but it is part of the game, and here's why it might be important. Um, and I got to dig that letter out. I probably wrote him a dozen or two dozen letters over the years. Nice. Um, and then at some point, like in high school, I stopped I stopped asking because I just felt confident enough as a as a dungeon master to run with it, right? Yeah. So, so Wolfgang, here was mine. Yeah. How much does a legless gnome weigh? <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome question. Yep. That, that was, that was it. <laughs> he got because they put him in a backpack because he got both his legs cut off. So you know. So there you go. And Skip is opening this letter, going. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, he answered it. <laughs> of course he did. Of course he did. Yeah. I, his patience was good, and he, he just kept chugging through them. And yeah, yeah. pre-internet. I mean, the only reason I still have these things is they are typewritten on paper and still stuffed in the envelopes with ten cents of postage on them. That yeah. they wow. like, I saved them all because they were yeah. official, right? Mm -hmm. They were the word from Lake Geneva. TSR had spoken. Yeah. Yeah. Skip Williams had had delivered the answer, it, and it, you know. It's so like iconic when you go back and think about it that you know we were, you know, some of us were in high school and doing this. You went and then went into um, it, right to TSR. How did that happen? What 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 transpired for you to go from you know where your, was, your career was to to D and D? I was in college as a teaching assistant. Um, I was working on fruit flies as a biochemist, and then I worked on a history of science sort of project on cold fusion, documenting all of that. And then my grant money ran out. Oh. And the university said, well, this is a temporary hiccup. We'd like you to come back, but we're going to have to let you go for a semester because we just don't have the funding at the moment. And I was like, oh, OK, that's bad. And my buddy Steve, my <laughs> co-author on Rose for Talakara, said, Hey Wolfgang, I, I you know I know you're just sort of sitting around for a semester doing odd jobs, but I heard TSR is hiring. Like they need someone to help them at the magazines. And I was like, all right, that's great, Steve. Are you applying? No, dummy, Wolfgang, go apply. <laughs> oh, oh, you're right, Steve. I have written many modules for them. Nice. Maybe they'll give me a shot, right? If I'm a writer, maybe I can be an editor. I, they know me a little bit. Yeah. And he convinced me to go for it. And I sent in a resume and I got a call back and they said, can you come in? And we'd like to do an interview. Um, and I, I went and I met these people who I knew as, you know, the authorities, Kim Mohan and Roger Moore and Barbara Young, who essentially were Dragon Magazine and Dungeon Magazine for well, in Kim's case, 30 years, right? But, um, and they talked to me and I tried not to stutter and I, I don't think I ate any lunch. It was like a lunchtime <laughs> interview. But at the end of it, they said, okay, great. Thanks for coming in. We'll get back to you. And I was convinced I had blown it. This was my one chance to go work for TSR. And I'm like, oh man, well, I'm glad I gave it a shot. 
And I went home and forgot about it. And then I got a letter and they're like, we'd like you to come work for us. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and of course I immediately said, yeah. And I told the university, sorry, I'm not, I'm taking a job somewhere else. I'm sure you'll find someone else to do fruit fly genetics. Whew. I'm going to work on D and D. They thought you were the most stupid thing to do. They thought that was, yeah. um, Definitely and I work with, yeah. had a wonderful time. I mean, I knew Lake Geneva a little bit, but it was, it was quite an adventure just showing up there and meeting yeah. people like Skip Williams or Zeb Cook or, or the like. Yeah. Jim so Ward. What year were you hired and started? I started in 1991. Okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And right. I stayed till 1995. So it was about a four year run. Okay. And I started as very much the junior guy at Dungeon, um, Dungeon Adventures, reading the slush pile. And I wound up. When I left, I was the editor of Dragon Magazine. Um, but it was a very tumultuous time. That's the time when, yeah. you know, magic took off and, and uh, <clears throat> Vampire the Masquerade was huge in the early 90s. And and the TSR crowd was like, man, are we going to lose a generation of role players to Vampire? Right? Um, so the company wasn't doing all that well at the time. But I was thrilled just to be there working on things like Planescape and al -Kadim. Yeah. Yeah. No, I look back at some of that as a really interesting creative time. Um, so, and yeah. But since then, yeah. it's yeah. been, you know, another mm, some years. Yeah. Yeah. You can... Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, you prefer homebrew over systems, which is cool. I mean, uh, existing ones. But, uh, but, um, you kind of were, unlike Bruce Cordell, who told us he was in, in the general RPG department uh, with, right. when Wizards, uh, that didn't exist yet at this point. They had, you know, they didn't separate people out. They just, you got a task and they asked you to do it? Or was it like, can I do al uh, I Can I do Planescape? Or how did that? Well, I mean, working in the periodicals group meant I had to deliver um, my part of the magazine work every month. Okay. Right, both Dragon and Dungeon. Everybody worked on both. Okay. Um, but the Al Kadim work I got, you showed Assassin Mountain on screen earlier. Yes, I, right? I or through. Secrets of the Lamp, one of them. What, yeah. That was my first standalone D and D product. Yeah. And it was a box set, right? One of those skinny Al Kadim boxes. Which I was I thrilled. Oh, there Shoot. it was. I went by it. Yeah, I, you I, went I, past I, it. I put so much in here that I wanted to. Oh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Secrets of the Lamp. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. There we go. I mean, getting to work with genies, and I was very happy. That was the second Alcadine box I did, but I got to shoehorn in the City of Brass, right? Because that's very much the Afridi sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and. Where? I was told, basically, you can write this stuff as a freelancer. We'll pay you on top of your salary, right? Oh. That was how it worked for someone in the periodicals department. Like, Bruce was a full-time designer. He had to do a lot of words every month and deliver good quality adventures or psionics books or whatever it was he was asked to do. I picked up freelance projects and worked on them evenings and weekends, Um and I didn't get as much written because I was busy putting out magazines too with, right. you know, regular hours. Mm -hmm. So the stuff I published in that period was things like Doom of Daggerdale and these sort of skinnier boxes. And then half of Planes of Chaos okay. with Lester Smith and half of Planes of Law with um, Colin McComb, I think. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. But, you know, I, I didn't have, I didn't have, uh, the hours to do as much as Bruce did, but I, I was perfectly willing to sink a lot of time into Al Kadim and Planescape. It was wonderful stuff. So uh, David Leonard, who uh, is um, Greyhawk Musings, one of the a fantastic blog out there, asked, uh, "Do you have a, an Al Kadim? Because it was new uncharted territory. Do you have a favorite publication that you worked on uh, for, for Al Kadim?" Yes. Um, I worked on the Monstrous Compendium, which some people will remember as those three-hole punch things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the 
so I did that for Al Qadim. I did Secrets of the Lamp and I did Assassin Mountain. I have to say I like them all. And the map of the city of brass that I got to do with David Sutherland, he was the cartographer. I only gave him a sketch, right? But the official city of brass map in Secrets of the Lamp was a giant highlight for me because it blew my mind that this cartographer is the guy who drew the cover to the Dungeon Master's Guide that I'd been, and the Monster Manual you know, that I'd cool. used yeah. for years. The iconic yeah. pictures. Yeah. The yeah. Iconic, so, iconic pictures. Great stuff. Um, Here, here's a question, and if I miss this, I apologize, but after second edition, yeah. did you work for Necromancer Games? I did not. Okay, because City of Brass came out with them. I thought, oh my gosh, Wolfgang may have done that too. No, no they okay. did their own City of Brass, which okay. is a meatier, oh. bigger thing. It is, uh -huh. yeah. Um, Hardback. And it's, right? Whereas Secrets of the Lamp, it's like, well, we talk about the, okay. all the elemental planes, plus the Jan, plus how it connects to Zakara. There was a lot to fit into a box. Um, but it wasn't just the City of Brass. No, but I revisited City of Brass, or rather Steve Winter, did it in the Cobalt Press publication called City of Brass. Right, let's go to um, it. It's, yeah, on the Cobalt site. No it's like four bucks and, I don't know, 30 or 40 pages. It's not gigantic, but it's kind of a tour guide's view. It's super playable. And in the Steve Winter style, uh, the City of Brass from Cobalt Press is, uh, it's got spells in it. It's got a ton of adventure hooks. If you just want something, it's the opposite of the Necromancer Games version. Yeah, Garbage. that's it. The left with the, the black and white cover. Cool. It's three ninety nine for a PDF. Warlock Patreon City of Brass. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's in no way anything like the Necromancer Games version. It's, okay. if you're going to have a short run through the elemental planes and you want to make it kind of juicy, or if a scroll appears from some fire elementalist, well, here's some spells for that. Yeah. Um, so I, don't, I like the City of Brass. I like everybody's treatment. And then we did a couple of adventures called Monkey Business, which are set in the City of Brass. Um, but yeah, Cobalt Press keeps going back to some of these elemental and genie-like things. We're going to awesome. do the same. Yeah, we're going to do sort of our own al Kadim for 5th edition, of course. We have uh, the Southlands Kickstarter starting up in about yeah. a week here. Um, which is Arabian, Egyptian, yeah, fantasy, African. Fantasy. Fantasy. Yeah, so I have never quite let go of that influence from the early days. Uh, yeah, with... th that's yeah. One of my my um, impressions of Cobalt Press is more setting heavy than a lot of the uh, other third party publishers and and RPG publishers in general. It's a lot yes. of of setting depth into it, so to speak. Right, and settings, and I think the monster books are also a yeah. huge mm -hmm. part of what we do. Right, like yeah. nobody. I mean, I keep telling people it takes us two years plus to generate one monster book. Right, so we start working on a monster book. <laughs> a year before we kickstart it because it just yeah. takes that long um, to get enough monsters of good quality, edited, play tested, illustrated. Um, but setting materials always been a love of mine, even though I know like players options are sometimes more popular. Um, but no, we do setting books really well. <laughs> I'm so glad that you do because I'm I'm playing a part in them because they have more maps than than the monster books have. So I'm I'm yes. very happy that you do. So it's, it's well, your Southlands map, Anna. I mean, the first yeah. one kind of blew me away, and it's just it brought a level of realism to the. Region? Yeah, but actually, the first one I threw away. That was one of the cool things. I'm going to write a blog post that's going to come later, and an essay about my my Southlands mapping. And and one of the things, spoilers, we can put is that I actually worked. I had about a year deadline when when you approached me, thankfully early enough. So I had about a right. year to finish it. And this is about six years ago, I think. Right. And and, and so I worked about seven months and then i realized this is not good enough so i threw out the whole damn thing and started over again and did it again and i'm so glad i did because the end result is way 
better than the first version of it. But so yes. I think that it might be good to put the first version in that essay, say that was part yes. of the development to, to put that in, because I haven't shown that to anyone. You and a few of the Cobalt Press, the only one that saw it because we worked on it, but right. it, it wasn't good enough. So I threw it out and started over again. So I know. So, and that's yeah. always a really hard creative decision to say, I'm yep. not, I'm not happy with it. Yep. I've done it rarely well nothing like seven months worth of work on a on cartography but you know i'll start writing an adventure or a manuscript and i'll say this isn't going the right way yep uh and sometimes i'll just abandon it but sometimes i'll start over yep it's tough but i think you made the right call because the final result is amazing and I, i've seen your work for the the new edition of southlands is coming along and it's even better because of course you've learned a lot in the last five years oh well, yeah and we also brought it up to the same standard we did for the other midgard maps that that are yeah. main newer so to speak so they now work together fully and they are the same same standard the whole thing and it's actually one big map That's yes the, yeah mm -hmm. there is you one can big actually map see that if people haven't seen your work on this the midgard map is available for free online yep it's we can put searchable the... it has filters it has oh, a political yeah, layer oh Absolutely. it's amazing uh, I think it's cobaltpress.com. Whack. Yeah, I can put. I have the okay. the, yeah, the so URL right. here, so I can post it. And it will pop yeah. it right into yeah. chat. Yep. It it's so here. it's yep. searchable. You can do point to point uh, distances on it. You can search by name or by like dungeons, ruins, locations. The ley lines are on there. Um, adding that political layer, I think was fantastic too because you can see either all the beauty and geography of the forests and the rivers and the mountains or if when you need to just see the hard political borders mm -hmm. um you can click on a filter and that overlay shows up but you have your choice which isn't something you get with a printed poster yeah it's it's gorgeous um so um questions are piling up which is great oh, i let's love take that <laughs> so uh here's here's the question number one for me i'll do myself first. what if you go back to the beginning days classic tsr modules what's sure. your favorite and why uh, <laughs> uh that's Kids. that's yep. like which is my favorite child right i i think a lot of the ones that hit me early that i i love to pieces um are some of Gary's stuff. Uh, Homlet, because I got to play through it. And you I mean this? Get to... Yeah, that, one. that <laughs> I, exactly... I was ready. <laughs> you were ready. You got it. Actually, we, we threw an homage to Homlet. We did some Homlet-like art on a recent Warlock piece called Red Tower, which is really just a village with a big dungeon nearby. Might sound familiar. Um, but yeah, I love that one because I got to be a player, and usually I was the dungeon master. And the other one that I loved to pieces was Vault of the Drow because it was mm -hmm. so alien. And, uh, yes. Which I, you know, bought before it was packaged with the rest. And then I waited some time for... Yeah, because um, you could get D1-2 together and then D3 was still separate until they did uh, the uh, Queen of Spiders. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Which was a great addition too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to ask you this question because it's a personal one for me as far as if you – I'm not addition worrying. I'm not area oh, worrying. No. But <laughs> it, would you – your drow, your dark elves, would you base them in D3 off of uh -huh. how they are in D3, buckler, weapon, or would you base them in the Menzo Barons and box set? Oh, I like D3. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank because you very it's much. what I saw first. There are things to love about the Menzo yes, box, which I believe was published by TSR. Right, yeah. If not while I was at the company, then either immediately before or after. What year was it? Menzo is a good it. box, I but D3 here, so got me it. first. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I just, because um, D3 has death lances, uh, yes. you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. The Wanda Vista globs. Uh, the fighting styles are not ridiculous as far as, you know. It's, plus, it's got the, oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah it's got yeah. the Trampier art, too, like that yep. demon prow. Yep. The demon prow on a, the it's ship. It's a hefty. Oh, hefty yes. It's a yeah. little bit squished in the transfer from Sweden to California. Yeah, that, at the very end of the adventure, they have yeah. that the ship outside of the egg, right? Let's see here. Uh, that ship outside the egg yeah. was the inspiration for some of the ships in Empire of the Ghouls. 
Really? Um, cool. Oh yeah, there's some very ships. cool. Ghoul like because Trampier's art was so small, it was a tiny piece. Right. But this is um, 92. 92. Yeah. 92. Oh yeah. So says, I was yeah. It says I was 92. at the company at the time and I opened yeah. it up and I said, Oh, it's a toy box. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was clearly a much newer yeah. sort of take. A forgotten realms take. Yes. It was and definitely yeah. nothing wrong with the realms take. There's nothing wrong. Um but they're they're different. Yeah. Absolutely. So, here, uh, so Wolf Thing, just so you're aware, we're doing a, we're doing a giveaway tonight. We do a lot of giveaways. Of course. Uh, I'm doing reprints for, um, and one of them was one of them was Hamlet, and the other one is in honor of our friend Len. And these are uh, courtesy of uh, Canadian Ancient Gamer. Uh, we're doing a, a Bone Hill. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. So, Man, I feel like I should give away an Empire of the Ghouls too. You want to do that? Yeah. We can yeah, add that in easily. Not? Yeah. All right. Throw in a a hardcover. Hard okay. We'll make that the first giveaway, and then the second one will be your choice. Uh, the second person will do the choice of Village of Hamlet, or uh, and then the third person will get what's uh, the one of the two that's left up. Thank you. That is wonderful. Thank you yeah, so very oh, much. Yeah. Empire Absolutely. of the Ghouls hardcover. Yes. Um, awesome. Wonderful. Um, so here are some other questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, Cannibal Eridar. Uh, S and uh, it, it just scrolled through the uh, Raiders of the Black Ice. Yeah, okay. you know, uh, if you want to go over that a little bit, your thoughts on that. And he said, "Do you have any Cobalt Press material similar to that concept?" Oh wow, um, we don't do anything that I would put in that category, unfortunately. Okay. okay. Um, we have there's a. Lou Anders keeps a spreadsheet of all the adventures published by Cobalt Press, and it's up to 225 adventures or so. Uh, and it's searchable by terrain type and level and those sorts of things, uh, which is incredibly useful when you've been publishing for over a decade, right? Right, yeah. Um, but I don't think we have anything okay. that's going to match that. It's a very particular flavor. Yes. Uh, what were your thoughts when you were creating it? Did you just like, you know, it's it's a iconic adventure too. It's another one. It, it, it just sure. people know. People are like, wow, you know. When I didn't realize you had written that when I was going through my research. I was like, oh my gosh, you wrote this too. Yeah, I've written a lot. And I think with adventures, it's weird. When I was a kid, I wanted it to be sort of gritty and realistic adventures, sort of low fantasy Conan like stuff. Mm -hmm. But when I actually write stuff, <laughs> it's like, I don't know, that's too boring. Let's put in, you know, a clockwork fortress. Let's put in ice boats. Let's put in sand ships from the court of the djinn, right? Like, let's go big because the fun part of DD for me isn't. Yeah, we clawed 20 copper pieces out of this hole in the ground and we robbed some tomb. Like the fun part for me is you would never see this in real life. It's right, the sky city, the uh, the ley lines that transport you across a continent. Those things have to be in an adventure for me to feel good about it as a designer. Um, big drama and big scenery. And yeah, Empire or Kingdom of the Ghouls for that matter. It's like it's a pretty weird place, <laughs> but it's cannibals. but that's the great thing about fantasy and D and D and just you can get away from the real world and just have fun with it. You yeah. know? Right? That's like the so villains awesome. have to be huge. It has to feel separate from the real world. I, I get people who want to play vampire in like an urban environment or want to play Ars Magica in sort of the Middle Ages plus a little more magic, right? But. I don't know. D&D &D for me has always been pretty... It's been best when it's weird. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of weird, yeah. Grendel Wolfslayer, who's Gitano, one of our longest uh, uh, subs and friends, any good memories of Dark Matter and Alternity with, all, oh, right? Yeah. Which was you worked on, how much did you enjoy sci-fi? Oh, goodness. Yeah, I mean, Dark Matter... It was in that era of the X-Files and weird stuff, and um, it gave me an excuse to ask friends and family, including my father, uh, to go research, like, the Illuminati, or, you know, I need to know the approximate range and distribution of Sasquatch sightings in North America. And 
given that it was published in 99, I want to say, um, it, we use the internet some to get weird Mothman facts or weird <laughs> Illuminati facts or pictures of Rosalind Chapel. But um, the research on that book was a blast. And it's a setting, you know, full of aliens and weird tech and occult everything. And the Vatican Library really is protecting you from things you don't want to know. Um, I love that project, but it was too big for me. Um, when I made my turnover, I was like, I don't think this is enough. I think it's kind of a mess. I think I need a co-author to come back and clean it up. And that co-author happened to be Monty Cook. Oh, that's <laughs> a good one. Yeah. Right? Like I had, yeah. I had all this great stuff, but it needed either a really strong hand in editing or it needed a co-author. And I think Monty has a great sense for the weird and strange. And um, years later, I'm like, so what did you think of that? And he's like, yeah, it had great bones. And, you know, he, he said kind things about it, but I kind of knew he, he got a turnover that was... Uh, diamond in the rough is probably the nicest way to say it, right? I had to spend a lot of time on research for that project, and I love how it turned out. But at most, that book is half me. Uh, it's probably more like two thirds Monty and one third me. He was I a busy guy. I, I, he was so, a crazy busy guy right there. He was busy launching his own company at the same time. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, this this caps off an unbelievable like last couple of weeks. We've had Skip. We've had Bruce Cordell, Sean Reynolds, and now uh, you, Wolfgang. What a, um, oh, the content in that early, that '90s to the early 2000s, indeed, uh, just amazing amount yeah. of content that everyone has pushed out, and it's exciting yes. just to, re to relive it because a lot of people now don't know about these publications, especially the black bordered ones. And I wanted yes. to ask you this question because this is one of my favorites, and this is by Bruce Cordell, Bastion of Faith. But it has down yes. you have des design and editorial assistance in this. If you remember anything about this project oh i hate to tell you but i'm drawing a blank i i was occasionally asked to clean something up or okay. ask render an opinion or something um and usually it was just like uh we need a monster stat block can you give us this or okay. or can you can you do the proofread on something okay. right okay um but honestly, I don't remember no what it was. Yeah. I mean, it had because so much going on It was on simply then. because it had so much cool Greyhawk credentials yes. and stuff in it. That, yes. That's why it was for this, the audience of this channel and the stuff. It's, it's one of right? the Right, but really that was cool Bruce content. nailing it on that. Uh -huh. I, yeah. I got asked in to help out because he ran short or needed new eyes. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. Hey, appreciate the candor on that. It's just, you know, there's yeah. so much detail in that era uh, yes. This one here, Frostburn, third edition. It's you, James Jacobs, and George uh, um, Stratikos? Yes. Um, well, we didn't hear much from, but <laughs> this was one of them, yes. Yeah. Uh, James Jacobs, of course, was is still the creative director over at Paizo Publishing and yeah. has done a yeah. ton of work since Frostburn. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I love the Northlands, Frost, Arctic, everything. Um, I think I did tons of encounter tables in here. I did some monsters. I did some magic. Um, yeah. yeah, that one was fun. Oh, Demon Wind. Oh, Wind. yeah. <laughs> I, I, have, I have to ask you about this, yeah. okay? Because oh, my God. What, uh, yeah. yeah, talking about, um, you know, there was, there's there's Expedition to the Ruins of Greyhawk, which redoes yes. the... And then there's this one, Expedition to the Demon Wind Pit. So, yeah. and you, this is all you, right? It is. It's pretty much all me. And I wrote it in a blur because it was kind of under the gun. Um, oh. It was to fun to, to do. I remember saying, wow, I get to play with the demon web pits. And I got to throw in every demon lord I liked um, as, as an NPC. And it was high level like that is not always my jam. But it was one of the cases where I really enjoyed writing stuff that I knew was going to be... Um, difficult and where occasionally even the high level characters were going to have to talk their way through something. Um, I don't have deep memories of how it turned out right. after edits and publication. And I haven't gone back to it. I, now you're making me curious. Like, was it a good one? I, sometimes you don't know at the well, time. The way you know it's good is that 
in, in, reprints on DMs got are one thing, but to get an original one of these books, you're going to fork out almost a hundred dollars right now, right? Really? So that's how you kind of know when something's good when people want it. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, yeah. I've been like, trying yeah. to get one yeah. for a long time. Yeah, when the price goes up and up yeah, and up and up I, and up, yeah. then, then so that's, that's how you know. A good sign. It's hold up definitely. well over the years. Definitely, I, I'm, oh, ass, I'm assuming people. I'm assuming someone said Q1 is bizarre. The, the the ship at the end and yes. we need a rework on it uh, is that what happened it wasn't quite that but it okay. was yeah we need to we wanted to pick up uh strands i mean this happened with all the return sort of titles right all the expedition titles it's like this is classic D, &D but from the publisher's perspective it's for the wrong edition right like people who are playing third want access to this material and we'd be happy to sell it to them yeah. Um, yeah. so partly i mean and it sounds really mercenary but when you're a company that has as many iconic locations and characters and monsters as D, &D has over the years like why wouldn't you capitalize on that like why oh, yeah. wouldn't you go back and revisit like it's doing a sequel yeah. but the sequelness of it is changing the rules and expanding i had a lot more page count than the original right yeah so all the weird little quirks there was room to expand and there was time to go off on little branching sideways and from my perspective it's like well i get to revisit planescape again yeah right because it's a planner adventure and there yeah. aren't that many of them um were you freelance on this or at at watsy at this time i was at watsy at that time and i'm pretty sure that was a staff Okay. Project I wrote on the clock. Okay. God, I don't yeah. know. It's, 20, <laughs> it's 24 years ago, but I, yeah. I sure can't remember. Uh, the cool thing, there was so much more support material in Planescape and stuff like that that wasn't available and even invented when the first set of, of adventures set for the Drow and the Underdark and, and, and going right? out in the other planes. But so, so there was a lot more that you can tie into. And, and so oh, I second edition, yeah. yeah, made a huge difference for the cosmology mm -hmm. and the planes. Yep. Yep. Uh, and Zeb yep. and Monty and Colin and all those people who contributed to Planescape, Ray Valise, um, made it easy to do this in third edition, right? Yeah. Because we, we had a foundation. That's why I think that that is such a awesome product because it tied, had such a rich ecosystem to tie into and you did a good yes. job of, of connecting the, that to the old stuff and then connecting it to to a lot of the new stuff that had come out over the years. I think it, it was a great product for, for that reason too. So yeah. Yeah, I mean I, I'm torn now because 5th edition is revisiting things like Salt Yeah, Marsh, the, the, right? now we have a, a, yeah, we're gonna a get to that because generation of yeah, revisiting again 20 absolutely. years after or 25 right? years later. Yeah. Absolutely I, get to that. I think it's important that we revisit that stuff because otherwise yeah. the history becomes invisible unless you're, you know, a collector of or, or like the new generation that has come on board has yeah. been playing D, D for a few years and they want to know the coolest parts mm -hmm. but um but you usually can't get it right like yep. it's out of print mm -hmm. uh or someone will say yeah i remember but that was written for some other rule set uh some early edition so yeah, yeah I, I i'm pretty okay with doing sequels so long as it's not all sequels and uh, and that's understandable because uh, generationally, you know, there's so many new players out there, and I think that was the the, the concept behind Salt Marsh, and it seems to have been very successful. Okay. All right, so Gary Gary Hoolian's really going the uh, poking me, poking me, poking me on <laughs> Age of Worms. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So sure. uh, we got uh, we really want to talk about your participation because you did an entire whole adventure and that and yeah, that chain. most people ask me about rise of the rune lords but okay uh age of worms sure. oh, we haven't gotten to pathfinder yet right we have yeah you know i haven't i wrote one of the foundational pathfinder things which was commissioned and edited by the same people as age of worms right like the paizo yeah editing yeah. team that eric. asked me for age is eric and james and yeah. and other folks in that that group um, Age of Worms was a blast. They just said, we'd like an adventure. We'd like it to be this level. It's going to involve the, uh, what did Eric say? He said, it needs to involve the Wind Lords of Aqua, right? Oh, I, went past I think it. is what he said. Okay. Um, I'm like, great. 
sure. What do we know about them? Well, there's this, you know, a few Greyhawk references, but not too much. I'm like, all right. Guys. <laughs> like, what can we do with it? And I had to fit in with the installment. I can't remember where it is in the series, but it's not the first one. Eric wrote the first I, one. Yeah, I think it's a return to as it. Um, I have a list here somewhere, of course, and uh, I got it right here. Uh, I try to have everything at the fingertips I don't remember here. where it fits in the Age of Worms uh, sequence. Number here. six. It is number six. Yeah, the heroes I return to Diamond Lake to seek out their patriot yeah. Yeah. Alustan yep. and present him with all they've learned of the cult of Kias and their activities. Yeah. Right. So it's like halfway through the yeah. adventure path, roughly. So. Right, right. It's halfway through, which, I mean, I was just trying to keep up with the writers before and after me because they were used to writing in the adventure path format. But for me, it was only the second time I'd done that where you have yeah. it's a baton race right like you need to set everything up yeah. to hand off to the next installment um which sounds easy but it's like okay at the end they need to be one level higher and they need yeah. to have these six pieces of information and they need to be really mad at this guy who has escaped them or or whatever the yeah and you can't there's certain antagonists you can't kill because they're supposed to be in later yeah, adventures and previous although they're or, pretty yeah. good. I mean, the uh -huh. Paizo group or the Dragon Magazine group at the time, um, you know, they were good about saying, well, we know most parties are going to try to kill any antagonist. Mm -hmm. And so they tried not to make it required that NPCs show up between chapters, right? Like, ah, you okay, could, so you can have your own menagerie that the players can kill or kill off, so to speak. The characters. Right, and, yeah. and sometimes they jump from chapter to chapter, or you hear about someone in yeah. the chapter earlier, like, oh, this is the big bad, but you don't see them until the next group or the next sequence. Um, Age of Worms was fun because it was sort of epic, big, splashy fantasy. Um, and... And I think it was sort of the swan song for Dragon and Dungeon's team, right? After that. Yeah, I think it was then that that was, it was. halfway through they got the that and expeditions they, to the yeah, Runes of Greyhawk. We talked to, to Eric Mona yeah. here. He said that, that yeah. they had a few months, they knew a few months before that that will be the end of That's of, it. So yeah. everybody who was invited in was like, Okay, you know, if we're going out, let's go out big. Yeah. And and they said there's no reason to hold back or save stuff or be coy. Let's just make it as spectacular as we can, as good yeah. as we can. So you so knew that, when you wrote it that this will be the end, so to speak. That I don't think I knew. I don't <laughs> remember them uh -huh. filling me in on okay. hey, yeah. by the way, we're we're gonna go form our own company and we're not <laughs> right. No, but, yeah. Yeah. But, but that became the, the mission, so to speak, for the and so did right. they hire you right off the bat, or did you freelance for them at Pathfinder? I never, I never worked at Paizo. Okay. Uh, I always freelance, but that I think the work I did on the Age of Worms is what they led them to ask me: Would you write Rise of the Rune Lords? That and like oh, chapter yeah, you four. Worked on Rise of the Rune Lords, yeah, the yeah. most iconic Pathfinder adventure. Did it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that one was a blast as well, yeah. and they've reprinted it in special editions and brought it yeah, forward in a couple of ways. Yeah, come again, and yeah, for yeah, mm -hmm. it's one of those things that uh, for them was the foundational uh, for for the Galarian setting, and yeah. I got to write in a bunch of lore and history of the fallen empires and the Oliphant of Jandale and all that sort of early yeah. Emerald Peacock God stuff that. Um, that turns into things five years later in later adventure paths. It was a blast to be there at the start for Pisa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gary says you did Enemies of My Enemy, which is Savage Tide, which is which was still... Yeah. Oh yeah. my god, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that one. I missed it too. I didn't put that one. <laughs> I, I, I yeah. didn't get them all. So, uh, but uh, yeah, because that was, was kind of popular too, because that area of the map in Greyhawk was never really explored until right. Cauldron came out and, you know, Savage yeah. Tide yeah. and the whole. And of course, Eric Mona is a huge Greyhawk fan. Yeah. I think yeah. your listeners know. Oh, yeah. Uh, so every chance he had at Dragon, it was, let's do a Greyhawk thing, right? Or at Dungeon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I think a lot of that flavor and some of the same vibe does carry over onto the the Pathfinder side. Oh yeah, d definitely. Yeah. So real yeah, quick, uh, a, lot of a real quick Eric sure. blurb, uh, Wolfgang. Um, we during Greyhawk Con, Eric Mona was played the best 
right? And the best character oh, yes. ever. He was yeah. him and Luke Gagax played in a game I DM'd and it was oh, wow. unbelievable. Yeah. Eric is yeah. an unbelievable player. He's Fantastic. a great player. Yeah. Great yeah. player. Yeah. Wow. He played a, 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 so, a cleric of Rally Shot. Oh my gosh, the, the, it was it was the, hysterical. Yeah. And and he he was he played chaotic neutral so awesome. And Perfectly. then he took the MacGuffin, <laughs> the, the, the the thing that we were all there. He took to the, fight yeah, the artifact that he, he just took it and left. stole it and, and, and disappeared <laughs> with it with the very last spell. Live he streamed. Had one yes. Spell left where left. Oh, he that's a beautiful. All, yeah, he burned all his spells, and the very last spell was gaseous form, and yeah, he, he took it and potion, disappeared with gone. it, and potion of gaseous. Just oh my he gosh. burned everything else and he basically had no functioning limbs or anything yeah. <laughs> what so a wonderful what, what an un the best performance ever unbelievable yes. role play yep. and uh, yep. it was after such an seeing, honor yeah uh, after to, seeing that yeah, performance i can yeah. totally understand why he is such a high demand for 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 working yes. in the in the industry so to speak. that was a fantastic performance <laughs> Uh, I, personally, do you DM? You have a part, a group that you play for once in the moon have, every week, or I, you know, well, before the pandemic, I had some regular play stuff. Now it's kind of scatter shot, one shots. Okay, I'm trying to get a a home game started with uh with my kids actually because they're old yeah. enough now. Yeah. Good point. Uh, yeah. And I'm tr dipping my toes into online play, which. It's I'm up to my. It's good. It's better than nothing, but it's not the same. So you know, um, no. The most recent stuff I actually got to be a player in was Curse of Strahd, that uh, Steve Winter ran a while ago. Oh, nice. The whole thing. Yeah. And after that, it's all been play tests and sort of short arcs and nothing big, which I kind of miss right now. Um, but yeah, I. I think like everyone else, I'm I'm twitchy to throw down some battle mats and and run a classic crawl or or something with people around the table. Yeah. Well, no. oh. speaking of that, you do. Ha oh, it didn't come up. What the heck? I, you have a you have it. Oh, I spelled it wrong. You have a Cobalt Press Twitch channel, correct? Yes, we do. Yep. Yes, we do. And yeah, you do shows and live play and all sorts yeah. of stuff. Yep, yeah, we have a number of shows every Wednesday at noon Pacific. We do uh, chat and we have. Uh, we have an actual play for that Al Qadim Southlands uh, material coming up in December, real quick. All right, I just hit the follow button there, so there you go. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Definitely uh, trying to yeah, get you no, that two thousand. You're close. Yeah, we're uh, getting there. Yeah, it, it, it's good to see. So, um, who is your uh, who are your main? If you uh, you have a go to DM um, that that uh, is. On the on yeah. the on the channel mostly someone who works at Cobalt Press or is it a you know someone you have a good relationship with just so well um, we've had we've actually sponsored different groups like the Venture Maidens okay um, did uh, Rising Hunger which was a playthrough of uh, Empire of the Ghouls so that's Celeste Konowich as the DM okay. on that she okay. did fantastic with it um, I think they just wrapped okay. Um, and if you want to see that, it's it's available. Um, there's been a few other groups we've worked with consistently. Uh, v Muse, the Crafting Muse, um, has uh, ran the last air in the Cobalt Press uh, Margrave Forest for two seasons. And Dan Dillon, who's a staff designer at Wizards of the Coast, uh, ran the Midgard uh, Twitch game, The World Tree Burns, for... Yep three seasons i believe yeah, wow great great campaign he ran yeah that was fantastic and yeah. all of them have been great in different ways and we're starting up our southlands actual play um soon and i think we're gonna get a couple other groups that will it's a mix between sponsored and and our groups playing yeah um so okay. yeah we are we're a little maybe behind the curve on twitch like there are people who've been there longer but we've been doing it for a couple years now yeah. excellent well you got you just got four new followers there so hey. sly flourish is one of them so and slides yeah, wow. there you go happy to hear from so uh um very very cool also enoch Prag, tim and real long shot so thank you all for doing that really appreciate it um you get to you get out of that second edition and third edition era and you're coming yes. along and then you just uh, what was the time you said time to go it w was it that was what happened at uh, uh, with third to fourth edition and uh, it was time to leave Watsi or was it 
No, it was before that, actually. I actually okay. left Watsi maybe too soon in hindsight. Um, okay. It was, so what was it? Uh, Fallen Kingdoms, was that the magic expansion? Okay. In the mid-90s. I remember it. Overprinted. Oh well, my after, gosh, yeah. Right? Like, they overprinted it. Yeah. And people tried to return it. And all of a sudden, like, the magic boom, it didn't end. Magic kept doing great, but they realized they had hired like 600 people in the company and, and there were some financial problems and they laid off a bunch of people. Yeah. And I wasn't one of them, surprisingly enough, but it was a lot of, that was sort of the moment where I knew, you know, maybe I do need to be somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and I started looking around and that was... Yeah, probably 1999. So, okay. And uh, uh, you stayed freelance for a long time? I stayed freelance for a long time. I actually worked a gig at, uh, I worked a staff job at Microsoft for years. Okay. I was very happy there. Um, and then 2006 said, I want to write my own stuff. And yeah. I saw that Monty had done Mal Havoc and uh, Monty Cook Games. And I saw how drive through and PDF were changing the industry. And I said, what if I just ask people to hand me money and I will yeah. use that money to buy art and editing yeah. and maps and I will publish things. Yeah, and I had no started, idea. Yeah, you kind of started crowdfunding <laughs> yes. internally with it before that became a thing. So to speak. Right. First, I thought it was just a tip jar. Then I yeah. used PayPal to do crowdfunding, mm -hmm. patronage. I offered, yeah. I offered people, hey, I'll send you the thing. Send me 20 bucks and I'll send you the book, right? Yeah. That kind of so thing. So was uh, Cobalt Quarterly, was that part of the yeah. early plan? To that do? came after Dragon Folded, okay. right? Okay, yeah. I, I was mad. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> when that's Drag when I found it first, uh, Cobalt Quarterly. And, well, and, Cobalt and, Quarterly, yeah. yeah, it was all the people who loved Dragon Magazine as a print item and who had yeah. used that as a connection to the mm -hmm. hobby. Yep. I was like, well, I can't do anything as good as Dragon Magazine. I don't have the resources. I don't know how, but I can make sort of a fanzine in the same spirit I, as that. Yeah, I kind of loved it. It was so many I cool I loved it too, and I learned yeah. a ton. And people were, were good about subscribing. We had thousands of subscribers. And it went from, hey, I'm doing a few patron projects and a little crowdfunding without Kickstarter having been invented yet, to, hey, I'm running a magazine again. This is yeah. something I'm really familiar with, right? Like I, I knew the editorial side and art. I had worked with art directors at TSR and Lake Geneva. So it very quickly felt like, okay, we're going to do six issues, four issues. I will see where it's quarterly. Yeah. Plus a bonus issue. Plus, <laughs> you know. <laughs> some uh, extras, yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus some extras. And we had about a four-year run from 2008 yeah. to 2012. 12 or something, yeah. Yeah. Which was a good run. 23 issues, a lot of great content. I'm still really happy with all the writers I uh, I got to work with again. Um, people who were very, very nice to show. Ed Greenwood wrote some stuff. Oh, Eric cool. Mona wrote something, was actually our interview subject for issue number one. Um, we went to visit the Nine Hells, right? Like, it was a blast doing it. Uh, and I think it showed. But in the end, I was like, okay, magazines as a business don't make money and it was a labor of love for four years and I got exhausted um, so we folded it up and it was right around the time the Kickstarter started happening and a lot of fans were angry that Cobalt Quarterly was gone and I was like you realize this means I can publish hardcovers now right <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> Uh, things like the Southlands and the Midgard setting and Deep Magic um, and things for fourth edition, even like Courts of the Shadow Fae was a fourth edition release. Oh, yeah. Um, those things all came out of, well, I don't have to put out a magazine all the time. I have a little time to do big projects. Yeah. Um, and things like Empire of the Ghouls and deep magic for fifth edition or or the tome of beasts frankly would never yeah. have happened if i were still a magazine cool books yeah, yeah. what a wonderful that, cover 
Yeah. Yes. And then we have the uh, Midgard World Book. You, the that was World an older Book. version of Midgard, and this is the rework that came out. Was it like two years ago? Year? Yeah, twenty eighteen. Yeah. 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 So that one uh, is a nice beefy guide to the setting. Yeah, and it's of course, really beefy. It's, it's it beefy. really is. <laughs> we went a little overboard there, um, but that's good. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's the arc of the more recent years. Yeah. Is more and more um, publishing, not just my stuff, but publishing people I've enjoyed working with. Right, like well, Dan Dillon or Richard Green, or I mean, there's Kelly Pollock more recently. Um, Celeste Conowich is writing a few things. Um, and you also did something really cool that you took your own home setting Midgard yes. and turned it into Cobalt Press kind of home world home setting. I and know. Please there's... tell a little bit about the story, how, how it is to take your own homebrew setting and turn it into a viable setting. I was pretty reluctant about this because everybody thinks, you know, your homebrew campaign is lots of fun. The players love it. You love yeah. it. You're all having a good time. And that's true. But the problem is if you want to present it for publication, right? You yeah. need to present it in a very different way, right? Yeah. For someone who doesn't know any of it, you're not there to say, oh yeah, we do it this way. Dot, dot, um, dot. Yeah. Dot, right? Close the T's on everything. You can't assume yes. a single thing and that's tough. Yeah. Right? You have to do yeah. the history of the world and the pantheon and the nations and who are the major NPCs and where is mm -hmm. the struggle? And yeah. what's interesting about it? Why would anyone care about this one, right? Like, there's lots of great campaigns. Yeah. But is it is it different enough from what other people are doing that someone's going to say, yeah, I'm ready to plunk down 40 or 50 bucks on, you know, and absorb a whole new setting? Because yeah. it's a commitment on the buyer's part. So at first, I wasn't really convinced. I just said, well, I've got the free city of Zobek, which was the heart of my home campaign anyway. Yeah. It's like, we can just use that as our springboard for all of the Cobalt Press publications. And we don't need to do the rest of the world. We'll just say, anybody who wants to run Cobalt Press stuff, you just stick Zobek into your setting somewhere, find a river, find a forest. That's where Zobek is. It's a trade city. It's a crossroads. It goes anywhere. Yeah. And that lasted for about two years, right? Because <laughs> then there was a demand for other people to ask, like, what's out there? What's behind the forest? Well, what's, right. Uh... This is... This is frankly exactly what Gary did with Greyhawk. I was just right? going to say, it's just, everyone, and we are all Greyhawk fans, most of the people that watch the channel are Greyhawk fans, and they could clearly see all the parallels, taking your home right. setting, you have the main city that is yeah. in the center of the setting. and, and Yes, that, so, yeah. and that was exactly it. And then, of course, there are all the Greyhawk adventures, each of which mm -hmm. expands the setting or introduces yeah. new areas. And it was the same with... Zobek turning into Midgard, it was, well, yeah. we need another range of mountains, and oh, okay, we're yeah. going down the river and into the mountains. Yeah. And next thing you know, it's like, well, I have that material, but it's not fully baked. It was just or, little notes here and there, some scribbles and sketches. Sure, because you, yeah. you expand when you need to. Yeah. Right, the there's no point. Exactly. Yeah. And I had, I had notes from junior high school that's like, well, I need a city full of mages. Oh, well, I have one of those, and I, I have a, you know, the council and this and that and yeah. a city map I drew when I was 14. All right, well, I'm just going to update that for my current game. Um, and it's, it's a great way to grow a setting, right? Like Greyhawk grew pretty organically. Yeah. Lots of different people were involved. I mean, we think of it as largely Gary's, but Dave Arneson and Len Lakofka and, and other people contributed yeah. big chunks of the, yep. the cultures and the regions and and so it was with Midgard um, you know the the western wastes were sort of a uh, Brandon Hodge down in uh, down in Texas said well I, I want a big blasted wasteland where I can stick high-tech science and goblin tribes worshiping Cthulhu deities I'm like okay sure. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, yeah. and Jeff Grubb from uh, you know Spelljammer and Dragonlance and many other things yeah. said, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of ready to write an elf kingdom. I, I have these ideas for this, this elf group. I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, great. Well, can you make it kind of like the Holy Roman Empire so it fits with this? Eh, probably. Uh, so, and everyone added something to the pot and that's yeah. how it grew. And eventually it came to the point uh, a couple years in where they're like, all right, you need to write a setting book and publish it and get a map. Yeah. And that's Midgard. So, 
The Midgard yeah. book. Yeah. Yes. So Steve Winter, Jeff Grubb, Kim Mohan, yeah. all all of them participated. Yeah. And, oh yeah. And wow. the wonderful ways. cartographer of Jonathan Roberts that was Jonathan the Roberts, the guy in 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 the R fantasy RPG at the yes. time because he made the map for Game of Thrones, which was so cool. He, he yeah. was busy making the map for Midgard, Oops, and he yeah, came to yeah. me and said, "Please don't yeah. be mad." And I said, "Why would I be mad, Jonathan?" Well, because yeah. I'm going to be late with the Midgard map. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're giving me plenty of notice. Yeah. We haven't really said when we're publishing. Why are you going to be late, Jonathan? Because I've been asked to do the map for Game of Thrones. Yeah. And I like, <laughs> my head popped and I said, yeah. of course, that's more important. Please yeah. do that. Yeah. And, and it was so funny because the, when I s s saw Game of Thrones and saw that Jonathan Roberts had done the map for Game of Thrones, that's when I got asked to replace update Gen Jennifer Roberts maps twice in the same yes. year first uh, right? Southlands and or, or, and no they didn't but first Midgard and then he had done for another publisher for for um, for um, oh I'm 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 sorry uh, Hans um uh, do, do, do. Oh, it gets to me a little bit. Another novelist that that had done uh, books, and he had done a map, Jonathan Robert had done a map for him. So I got two, and I was like, "Damn, I should replace that." And it looks so damn good. So I get cold yes. feet, but thankfully I had done Southlands before, so I knew right. a little bit what I was getting into, and I started to find my my uh, my kind of of style for it, so to speak, because it's yes. a huge thing to go to. And a lot of people don't realize, because I'd worked on, on Greyhawk for 20 years, but Greyhawk was a setting I knew and played in for 20-something years. But oh, here's yeah. a setting that I knew nothing about, and I had to write, especially Southland, that was not written. The, the, when I started mapping it, there was right. nothing written. So, so well, yeah. And we've done this a couple times. Actually, this happens yeah. in D and D a number of times, right? Like yeah. for dungeon adventures, things like Undermountain, the map came first. Uh, the Scarlet yeah. Citadel that Cobalt Press just kickstarted, Steve Winner's big new dungeon. Yeah, we did the cartography first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so for Southlands, I think they kind of grew together, right? Yes, like your they did. Yeah, we were very much back and forth with Brian Suskind and and Ben McFarland that wrote a lot of of the the text and, and yes, it was, yeah, it it was very much back and forth and. The funny thing was that we reduced the size by half when we were right. like two months into it and stuff. So yes, we had a lot of. Because it was too big. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was too big because. And that's the other question I was asked. Midgard is very much based on a fantasy version of the real world, so to speak. Yes. So, so was that part of the design of Midgard all along, or, or is that. It was sort of an early creative decision. I said, well, uh -huh. what what will make it interesting? And I was like, yeah. I really want to drive home the point that it's not a scientific universe, right? Yeah. That um, chemistry and physics and all that stuff isn't necessarily true. It's a world of fantasy and myths. Mm -hmm. And so it's got to be a flat setting yeah. and it needs to have a world where writing is rare and fire is the only light you've got. Like I wanted it to have a primitive feel. So being yeah. flat and earth-like uh, was part of it. But the other mm -hmm. half of it is it tricks you. People look at the map and they say, oh, well, it's just a fantasy earth. And I'm like, yeah, yeah sort of, <laughs> because it's a shorthand that gets you into certain cultures and you sort yeah. of know what you think you should expect in a certain region. Mm -hmm. Except that, you know, then you say, well, I don't remember this part of Europe being overrun with Cthuloid monsters yep. and tribes of goblins with alien artifacts, right? Yeah, like there's that's... a twist to, to most areas. There is a weird, interesting twist to lots of them. To so, almost yeah. all of it, right? Like yeah. the the Southlands has a section that's very fantasy Egypt, mm -hmm. but there are parts that aren't very much like fantasy Egypt. Exactly, yeah. So um, it's it seems I'm familiar. sorry, Wolfgang, is Tomb of Tiberish in that area? Yes, okay, Tomb of Tiberish is, is right there okay. in the fantasy Egyptian section. So is Last Gas. Yeah. Uh, those two are both Southlands adventures, very much in that vein, uh, yeah. Desert of Desolation type stuff. Excellent. Cool. Very yeah. Cool. yeah. Uh, it, I could talk about Midgard forever. That's okay, oh, though. Yeah, this is great. Because, yeah, yeah. awesome listen, fun. we got uh, – yeah. everyone's just – you know what people are really excited about the discussion when they're just absorbing it all in, yeah. uh, yeah. which is which is a wonderful and thing. setting is something we talk yeah. about a lot, both on the, the, yeah. the, the our show on Wednesdays, the, the – and, yeah. and also Gabbins, Gabbins. So, anything yeah. goes here so, on the yeah. Gabbins so we show. have a lot of, <laughs> lot of setting so people in chat are often very setting interested so to speak right so well I mean Saltmarsh was, yeah. 
salt marsh was one of those things where it's like well we think we're doing setting stuff but no it's actually adventures at the heart right yeah and then the nautical rules we knew were going to be coming well like cobalt press logo doesn't appear in salt marsh but all the contributor the the main people doing the conversion are are all cobalt press regulars they're john yeah. sawatsky and uh steve winner and me so uh and hey, getting to play with that sort of setting, right? And say, well, we love Salt Marsh. We remember it from back when many of us have played it over and over. Yeah. Bringing it to fifth edition is great. And then sort of the cherry on top was, well, there's a whole bunch of coastal, nautical, island type adventures that were published in Dungeon. Um, ah, that was, which, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they asked me, what are your favorites? And I was yeah. perfectly willing to tell them, right? Like, well, yeah. I want the Styes and I want Isle of the Abbey and I want this, that, and the other thing. And they're like, great, why don't we add that yeah. to sort of bring back a new version of some of the, the things. Yeah, they all most... make use of the nautical rules. That's, I, yes. that, that seems to be the theme. Even if they're spread out geographically, they're still used to the, the, the nautical yes. rules. Yes. And if you like seafaring or if your players are interested in that sort of campaign, yeah. um, it's just the perfect the perfect foundation for that. Um, and of course we got to to tweak with a classic. So Yeah. All right. Can I uh, can I ask a question here? And I I don't mean anything. <laughs> I have to. Um, sure, do it. Uh, there's something I uh, there's something that bothers me. I like oh. this, and I think this is great, and I really appreciate the effort here. There's not a one new adventure. No, no, it's like Yawning Portal, right? Okay, it's, okay. It's very much a throwback collection. Whereas okay. things like Curse okay. of Strahd or Tomb of Annihilation update a classic. Yeah. Um, I don't think we weren't really asked to like totally reinvent them. We were told, you know. Bring them back, update yeah. them, but don't don't change Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh too much, right? Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and I don't think we wanted to. It was kind okay. of a. <coughs> and I, yeah, I, I wanted to get a good perspective on someone who developed it with the, you know, yeah. just to, to hear but that. That's great, yeah. you know. But we talked Honestly. about it earlier. It's a way to bring back the old okay. classic in a way for for the new audience, and and meaning we played too long all of us three in, in that way to, to, to we are okay. not the target audience for this product. Right. I mean, we when are, we want to yeah. do something brand new, Cobalt Press is ready to say, let's do something brand new. Mm -hmm. And when Wizards wants to go do something brand new, right? Like, they will, but they'll probably have one of their in-house staff designers. Yeah. Like, you know, they'll have Chris Perkins and Dan Dillon and the rest of the gang uh, working on that sort of thing. Yeah. Who, so, approached, who approached you to lead this design and get the cabal oh, the group it together. was either chris perkins or mike merles i okay don't remember yeah. they're sort of or they were at the time the uh the people making the the freelance sort of higher decisions yeah and we had done okay with tyranny of dragons you know in the crucible say, yeah, press were kind of the, the, the design for the first was that the, the first big like adventure path for fifth edition? If it I was the first correctly? big adventure path, but it was yeah. split. It was because it was done so early. It was split into two books and then came into okay. one book later. Ah, okay, right? yeah. But and Lost Minds of Fandelver was if if it didn't ship sooner, it shipped shortly after. Yeah, it was supposed to be that Tyranny of Dragons was the adventure you pick up if you've been playing D anD D for a loss a long time. And Lost Minds was supposed to be, well, if you're a beginner and you don't really know where to start, we don't want to... Okay. Yeah, don't throw Tiamat and all the... the... Don't, yeah, yeah, don't don't make it too hard for someone who's just yeah. figuring out the game. And it turns out, right, like that those are two different audiences. You do want to design for them differently. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was a pretty smart way to go. And I was very pleased to, mm -hmm. to contribute. Yeah. It's... um. It was nice to see this come out, definitely. Yeah, oh, have definitely, that flavor. Yeah. And um, it's interesting that, oh, sorry. Uh, no, I have to ask this question. This is, uh, oh, yeah. What, what WOTC has tweaked uh, out there? Oh, we're kind of coming out content with three settings, mm -hmm. right? We've heard this, and then we heard what's going on with Dragonlance. 
Right. Is that on hold now, do you think? Or do you have any idea or you can't say or you just don't know? Or Well, they don't tell me, right? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't asked you to write for anything is what I'm asking. Uh, no. No. If, if they had asked me to write for Planescape, I would probably jump on it. I would jump on it right. and right. I would be all over it. Likewise, Ravenloft. Likewise, you know, Dragonlance, Les. al just... any of them, right? But yeah. al yeah. I, I think, you know, they're bringing back settings at a slower pace than they were released back in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and that's probably healthy. I think <laughs> Yeah. there's so much Planescape stuff in the existing books, though, right? Like, stuff I wrote for Planes of Chaos shows up in Morden Canons, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's just... Like okay, this is a monster I remember from the abyss, or or this is a place name that it sounds familiar. Oh right, um, so there. It's not that there isn't Planescape or Dragonlance or Spelljammer or Greyhawk material in in a bunch of the core books. It's just what everybody is used to is a big book like the Midgard World book, right? Or the Grey Box for the Realms, or a Gazetteer for Greyhawk, and and we don't have that exactly uh, in the way that people are expecting for... Like, we got Ravenloft, right? Like, I yeah. played through Curse of Strahd. I got to play Ravenloft. It was fantastic. Do I have a Realms of Ravenloft book? Not really. So, um, yeah. I don't know. I, I hope we get some of those things in time. I think they would sell well, but... D and D is about playing the adventures, so I can't fault them for doing it that way. Oh, and yeah. absolutely. Uh, appreciate the insight on that because uh, yeah. that's been a. Uh, it's been a. You know, you see it in the Facebook pages, and you see it all over the place. There's you know supposition as to what's going on, but you've put it yeah. out. You know, you you put uh, made a little clarity that you know think time, and when and when the time's right, you think that most of the. Most of the settings that are were popular. Is yeah, that your, your I mean, guess? I think, you know, much as I love Al Kadim, I suspect it's not making a comeback. I, I, I could be wrong. I'd love to be wrong. But, Ravenloft, yeah. If I had to put my money down, I'd say yeah. There's probably yeah. going to be a Ravenloft book, or, um, or a more comprehensive Realms book, or I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Pick. Okay. I, I remember two years ago at, at Gary Con, uh, Mike Merles had a, a, had a presentation and a seminar when he discussed the thing. And that, that was one of the, the many questions asked. The question was asked in many different shapes. What setting is coming back, so to speak? And, right. and, and he had an interesting when he described some settings as, as the home base, so to speak. That's where you, where you game from and, and, and you, you right. come from and the characters stay in and, and you develop for. And then he had what they call destiny nation settings and, ah. and that that are like like raven that, that you go to and you have an adventure or two and and something happens yeah. and then you go back to and, and there was back. a third type that was the the, the the hub so to speak where you can kind of go between the transitionary planescape and and sigil it's kind of the i think the most it's perfect the example yeah yes. that, that it's not the, your home base and 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 it's not really a destination it, it's one of these places that where you go transition through so to speak the hub and 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 I think that was an interesting, and and if I remember correctly, he said that we need to think about doing all three, but they need probably need different ways to published in different ways, different types of products and stuff. That was the, the gist of what he said. And that was right. very interesting and, and very, yeah, he didn't, of course, didn't reveal any details, but it was a very interesting discussion. And and I can really like the way he split it up into to different types of setting for different purposes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are times when you don't need, you don't need the whole setting, right? To yeah. enjoy Ravenloft. Mm -hmm. But True. maybe you want it after you run through that adventure, yeah. especially yeah. if you're a home brewer who's like, I just want to borrow the best bits for mm -hmm. my game. Yep. Um, so it's it's tricky, yeah. and they have this giant vault full of great settings, and every setting has its its big fans. I just hope that there's enough of those elements of the lore of Greyhawk. Um, sprinkled throughout book after book after book that people ask, oh, well, where's that from? Right? Yeah. It seems so with Tasha now coming out with the, the latest mm -hmm. book, also is a lot of 
reference to Greyhawk and, and other settings. So they, they right. seem to, to kind of weave in stuff and they are still selling the PDFs from old products on, on, on DMs Guild or drive through for sure. years. So they're available, even if the stat blocks and stuff of our previous editions, but you can still right. get the stories and, and all that and, and even get reprints from them. Yeah. So, I know, so but I think having a new release with, yeah. you know, Eberron Find or Greyhawk it. or yeah. Planescape, uh, acknowledged up front as this is where that is mm -hmm. is uh is okay. the particularly <laughs> yeah. strong vote of confidence and yeah. i think that's part of what's driving this on the fan side it's like people are worried that their setting will disappear and i'm like yeah. it doesn't disappear as long as you're playing it it doesn't disappear as long as the monsters and things get ported from edition to edition yeah um the idea that there has to be a world book or a campaign setting book for everything for it to be a living setting is probably wrong like eberron seems to be doing just fine uh and was doing just fine before all the campaign material came out yeah. right You're absolutely correct on that yeah uh, and there's some publishers who do adventure paths and and all sorts of stuff without actually getting the setting material together in one book but yeah. but i'm 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 a setting person and, oh, and yeah who yes. runs sandboxy and stuff so i kind of love the setting books even for settings i don't play in because i cannot take ideas for for from magic systems to to how oh, yes. you handle something and and like empire of the ghouls meaning i want to have my underdark theme for greyhawk so so i get right. the forgotten realms and i get the midgard books and then I read through them and, and get some of, oh, I, if I tweak that idea and put it in here, that will be the perfect for my take on the Underdark and stuff. Yes. And, yeah. you know, especially if you're playing with people who are veterans and have played a long time, yeah. sort of going to the Underdark and hauling out something from the Menzo box or something from Empire of the Ghouls as a surprise, it's worth it at the table, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It's written for the Underdark. It's loaded with that flavor. Mm hmm but they weren't expecting it because it's not in the module that was, you know, the original, yep. it's not in D3. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they've got to keep expanding. And, yeah. and I love it when people say, I, I dig your Midgard material. I put the Margrave forest into my setting or, you know, I've taken parts of it. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what a good DM should do. Find <laughs> what they like and put it yeah. in and, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not beyond ripping off Forgotten Realms. I was talking with Eric Mengi last night during the game. We yeah. we had an All Star uh, Living Greyhawk game last night, and uh, oh, fantastic! I yeah. I stole some Helm spells for Mayheen. Okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're, you're gonna you do it. So uh, the miniature and 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 you had all sorts of uh, yeah. Anna and, played. Anna and played last night too. That, it was fun. It was a twelve. <laughs> How, how old is, is Bill's son? Bill's that son, uh, Bill and Master Crafter's son, came idea. up with an idea for an adventure, and then we play tested it with our. We have a kids group, and we played. And then so I said, I like this so much. I'm going to play. I'm going to play this for the for the yeah. uh, Geoff Living Greyhawk people last yeah. night. So, so and they, it was, it was funny. awesome. It was a yeah. little bit silly and funny, and uh, but it was it was great. It was an yeah. awesome adventure. And you got, that's what you have to do. You have to be able to yeah. pull from different places. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, we had a question way back about. Um, Cobalt Press and what formats you support currently with oh, sure. new content coming out? Do you support 5e, obviously? Of course. Pathfinder 2? No. Pathfinder 1? Uh, not anymore. We still keep in print a few things that, okay. you know, we like. Um, the problem for us is that we've had such success with 5e. Okay. Um, and even publishing official material under the Watsi banner, right? Like that, yeah. it makes it hard to devote a very small staff to Pathfinder, okay. even though for years that was, well, we spent most of 4E playing Path Pathfinder. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So mostly everything that's going to be coming out this point on will be 5E content at Cobalt Press. Yes. Okay. Uh, the exceptions are things like the Cobalt Guide to World Building or the Cobalt Guide to Game Mastering, which are sort of any fantasy RPG, Neutral. any okay. edition. Okay. Highly recommend everyone to buy those those oh, yeah. kind of handbooks and and highly inspirational how to various things and, and yeah the world building especially since that's kind of my forte but it's fantastic it's yes. awesome authors doing it's kind of short essay chapter essays on world building and stuff and then you have yeah game design and 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 adventuring and stuff so it, it's it, those are books are fantastic they're I think they're available both I have them as PDFs but and a couple of them in print too but they and they're 
the PDF, there, I, I'm actually very proud of this. Those are the only titles we have in four formats. They're print, PDF, Kindle format, and some of them are oh. in audiobook. Oh, so, audio as well. Cool. Yeah, no, those Cobalt Guides won Origin Awards, Any Awards, etc. Yeah. So we try to make them available because they're so useful to yeah. anyone playing any system. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to make them really broadly available. So uh, throw out some questions here while we have uh, Wolfgang for a few more minutes here, and then we will yeah. um, we will you know but, not keep yeah, but you before late. You have to <laughs> tell us about yeah, the, the, uh, the upcoming stuff and, and yes. the latest things. And, what, oh sure, uh, tell us about you know, some exciting coming. things yeah, that we'll that Anna's working on. Well, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> the I, most I exciting the thing. The, yeah, sorry. Go yes, ahead. the most exciting things is this is the Southlands coming in a week, right? So that's our. Uh, Egyptian, Arabian, uh, tropical, high fantasy. Um, it's a beautiful setting because Anna's map makes it beautiful. There's deep magic in the Egyptian areas, right? Uh, the city of the cat is where Bastet, the cat goddess, walks the streets sometimes in disguise. Um, there are hive cities of the insect folk. Uh, there are realms of the wind lords, the genies, the jinborn are a playable race. Um, it's, ah, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the Southlands, but I was caught off guard five years ago when we first published the setting because I thought it was sort of a niche taste and I did it because I thought, you know, we're never going to see more al Qadim material. How can I do yeah. things that are Arab influenced or African, Egyptian, any of that, right? Or how can I get a hive city of insect folk into my game? Yeah. Well, um, it turns out I'm not the only one who loves that style of fantasy. Um, and we have been getting requests for years to bring it fully into fifth edition. Yeah, so it was um, a bigger success than you thought it would be when, when it was, you launched it? Uh -huh. It really was. And we took pieces of it, like we, there's a Southlands Heroes book for fifth edition D&D. &D, so yeah. you can play Knowles and Minotaurs and the Jinborn. Um, but that's just a thin book for player races and a few subclasses, right? Um, the Southlands Kickstarter is going to be three books. It's going to have the world book with your beautiful new fully revised and updated map, Anna, Thank and all you. the regional yeah. maps. Yeah. Um, and it's, of course, going to have rich city maps and all the conflicts, adventures, ruins, lore, secrets um, of the setting, plus the Pantheon, which has been totally revised for 5e. Um, and then it's going to have a separate player's guide and something we're calling a city book. So uh, it's not the Zobek, it's it's Per Bastet, the City of Cats. Wow. And the City of Cats book has adventures and a gazetteer. And it is meant to be the home base, uh, the Greyhawk of the Southlands. And man, that gazetteer is pretty juicy. I'm very pleased with how the art looks and the maps. Cool. Yep. Um, so yeah, there's, there's three parts. You don't have to get all of them in the Kickstarter. You can pick out the ones you like. The other nice thing about it is we already have a ton of adventures for this area, right? So it's not like we're going to push a setting out on Kickstarter and then there's nothing to do. Um, because there are literally dozens of adventures already in print for the region, starting at first level and going to, I don't know what the highest is we've got. I should look it up. Um, but yes, um, anything in the deserts, the jungles, the flying cities, the sand ships, all of it's there. Um, and it's just a revised, refined, better edition of the Southlands than we were able to do five years ago. Yeah. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm super excited about it. It's awesome. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, it goes back to those early days of, you know, not every adventure needs to be in a European style yeah um some of them can be wildly different and this is one of those very very cool so here's some uh, quickie questions here uh, do you have a, a go-to tool when you're dming <laughs> a sc screen i'm assuming you know dice but uh, someone wants to screen know and dice yeah, i've easy have yeah. gotten it's to the fun. laptop now yeah i will soon play by a zoom or discord or something yeah mm -hmm. so it's like i just leave some some pdfs open 
Uh, Cobalt Fight Club is my favorite for encounters. Ah, building. okay. That's a yeah. fun tool. Um, and yeah, that's probably it. Okay. I like Roll20 as a platform, but... Oh, okay. I, I'm still learning it. Oh, yeah. It o- takes... Over Fantasy Grounds. Well, I like Fantasy Grounds, too. I played with Fantasy Grounds for a while, and then I don't know why I stopped. So I, part of me just wants to run Theater of the Mind and use Zoom and okay. not monkey with the virtual tabletops. And I know that's not everyone's flavor, although I think Mike Shea might agree with me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so Gary Holian brought up something we haven't even discussed. You work, you did some work for Iron Crown. Oh my God, yes! <laughs> Before I worked at TSR, I did work for Iron Crown. I worked on two products for them. Um, the published one is called Treasures of Middle Earth, which was a compilation of magic items and equipment and I everything <laughs> from yes, yeah, from every oh Lord of the Rings Middle Earth uh, Iron Crown supplement they'd ever done. So it's it's just raw crunchy items from beginning to end and i was so happy to just get that project um and and just compile it tables lore it's not even a system i was that familiar with but i was um i guess i was an editor even then in some ways because i was happy to organize all that um so that's the one they published the one they didn't publish is um one where the rights became an issue and they they lost them. Uh, they had a Narnia RPG that I worked on. For wow, I didn't know that. Wow. Huh. Yeah, and I have a manuscript probably on an abandoned hard drive somewhere. <sighs> huh. And I adored Narnia as a kid. I read it to pieces. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like Lord of the Rings better, but Narnia wasn't bad because the best part of it, of course, is actual British children have found a way into a fantasy realm. <laughs> yeah, we all had those dreams and fantasies and ideas <laughs> yeah. of... of finding the secret door to the fantasy world yeah to this day i want to own a wardrobe just to fill it with coats right Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but but that manuscript was never published i don't think the the lewis estate and iron crown i i don't know i don't know what happened exactly yeah Yeah. but uh but those that's the only work i really did for them and uh they they were a good company and i i think having that on my resume when i went to uh, apply at tsr couldn't have hurt all right, so I got yeah. three more quickies here. You have a favorite character NPC Greyhawk setting. Oh, man. Did you work with Carl Sargent at all? Yeah, I did work with Carl Sargent. I don't have a favorite from Greyhawk because there's too freaking many. There is a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, I have the Fiend Knights. That looks like you. Oh worked. yeah. Yeah, because it, it's scrolling through. You have this one, this article, right? Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it says, by Carl Sargent, compiled by Wolfgang Bauer. Yeah, so. it was basically, uh, he sent us a big thing, and we try- had to cut some of it down into the size. I think it was maybe even leftovers from the Carl Sargent box. I think so. There uh-huh. it is. It was out of yeah. a, in a dragon. I think that, yeah, I think it was in dragon because there wasn't room for it in the box. June of 94. Yeah, that might be about right. Yep. Yeah. Um, Carl Sargent wrote some great stuff, and he was um, he was good to work with. But um, I, I I think he got some. I, you probably know the Greyhawk politics better than I. I don't think everyone liked his Greyhawk material, but I thought it was great. But yeah, once again, you pick and yeah. choose. I'm a ninety yeah, percenter. I, I, I liked, in, in, yeah, I liked from the everything. Ashes. He, yeah, yeah, I liked yeah. everything he yeah, did. Most of the things he did, except that he killed off the Horn Society. So, so yeah. but, but that, on the other hand, is something that makes me be able to tweak it in my own campaign. So, in a way, right. he did me a service by making it difficult. So that way, I can <laughs> kind of use my creative little creative juices to squeeze something or make lemonade out of lemons, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. No, so, lots of good stuff from Carl. So the last one I'll throw at you is, do you have a sure. piece of memorabilia that, or a box set or a, a publication? It's like, this is the, like, for me, it's probably the Deities and Demigods first print edition, mm. pristine. Or something someone signed, a map on the wall, a poster. Yes, yes some, yeah, something, anything. Something. I wish. You know, yeah. I have those, actually, I'll go back to the letters that Skip okay. wrote to me and yeah. answered sage advice. I'm like, cool. those mean something to me. Like, because at the time, it yeah. felt like the vo- official voice of TSR just reached through the postal system. And, and you know, yeah. that was cool. For actual books, I 
am less of a collector than some, probably because I've been working in the industry so long um, that it's hard to maintain the collecting instinct. I do still sometimes publish hand-bound leather editions of Cobalt Press stuff. Oh, and some of those are beautiful. I'll pull one. I off saw an shelf. Empire of the Ghouls I, I have, I have uh, limited too. edition on here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah let me pull. Oh, look at that length. <laughs> yeah, I have. I there you have go. One here. Well, this one's Tome of Beast Two. Okay. Yeah. Done as a leather bound. Nice. Edition yeah. with Very fancy nice. end papers, and yeah. I'm just fond of editions like that. Yeah, yeah. I have the Midgard word. Classic here, looking. That is. Yes. Yeah. Sort of a classic look. Beautiful. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Wolfgang, would it be like anything you would like to say in closing? You know, I don't want to, like I said, keep you too long. No, and I appreciate I'm you coming glad. on. Oh, of course. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm always happy yeah. to talk D&D. Um, Greyhawk's been a, a fantastic world for years, and I'm glad to have contributed little bits to it. And yeah, Cobalt Press is chugging along. Come check it out if you don't know it already. Uh, we have a Patreon called Warlock, and we've got this Southlands adventure. If if anything involving deserts, tombs, undead, and uh, high sorcery is your jam, please come check yeah. out the Southlands. And I think uh, someone tonight's going to be really, really happy getting a hardback Empire of the Ghouls yes, hardcover that uh, that uh, Wolfgang was so kind to give away in our in our drawings. So we're doing three. And we're going to do that, and then uh, the second one, we'll get a choice between these two classics, because Wolfgang said this yeah. was one of his favorites, right? Two, Village yes. of Hamlet, and then, in honor of Len, because our great friend Len, who was on the show about 40 times. Oh, which is, wow. Oh, and Len was, yep. Len would just hop, uh, so Wolfgang, Len would hop on just in the middle, right at the beginning. And he talk. came in uninvited. He <laughs> 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 just came, so he just popped in. And, and, it wasn't and, so much a guest as a visitor. Oh, that's oh, yeah, great, he, he though. Was instead, it was yeah. awesome. And then he left without saying goodbye. Yeah. He just popped out. He, and so we knew a certain minute. Yeah. He'd just be like. And we had he, him till about 8.25 Eastern time, uh, uh, either every Wednesday and Sunday. He'd come yeah. on for about a half hour, 45 minutes, yeah, say his and, piece. Oh gone it was great yeah. oh it was awesome it was yeah. so wonderful yeah. and, and his best comment was when someone said he said, said nope yeah just nope it. one yep. that was it nope yep. so uh, he, so. It what was a awesome. what a wonderful and, wonderful yeah, well, i've had a wonderful time on this show okay. i don't think I, i'll ever have 40 appearances anywhere but it's great to hear that you guys are rolling yeah. rolling rolling like this so we yeah, got a quick for having me on. Oh yeah. yeah, our pleasure, our pleasure. Um, yep. So, uh, r real quick announcement wise, all right, and then we'll do the drawing. Um, so, I got because of Thanksgiving, we're on Tuesday night. Tuesday night, we got going back into the depths. I'm going to play Sean K. Reynolds' Crossbows and Crossbones from the RPGA, which was a supplement to the Slavers. I won't tell you how I got it, and Sean can't tell me. Sean won't tell anyone how I got it either, but we I have it. We're going to run it, and we're going to run it on on uh, on Tuesday night. It's a one-shot. And let's see here. I want to show someone. I got the terrain up already. Uh, real quick here. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Oh, uh, yeah. So you haven't seen my gaming basement yet, Wolfgang. You may go it's a little awesome. crazy. He has more gaming stuff. Yeah. Than, so than here we go. Game here's here's oh, he has a my. game table that is enormous. Yeah. It's, oh it's, my! It's the I want to play at <laughs> your table. The basement of the, the whole. Yeah. That's and, why I wanted to play, right? So yeah, uh, here's another uh -huh. picture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's another there. picture I've, of it and, from the side. Uh, you know. Last year. I, yeah. I we got some 3D playing. prints. We got Miniature Building Authority. We got Reaper yeah. all sponsoring the channel, and also it's, yeah, there's it's some. Just amazing. Yeah, so we're we're we're, we're set for it. So um. Yeah, really nice, and uh, it's forty years of accumulation too. You got to, you know, so please, please don't. And some ships, yep. some ship combat here. Uh, nice. You know, we got, uh, and that's Boxes that's some miniatures, and, and uh, so we got the village of Ors up outside of Harby <laughs> for for this yep. uh, adventure written by Sean, and we're gonna run that. And then Wednesday night, Wednesday night we're gonna do uh, um, what you are you thankful for? And holidays in Greyhawk will be the discussion on Wednesday. So uh, you know that'll be another good one as well. Um, and you mentioned the, the health of the uh, group, uh, Wolfgang. I wanted to talk to you about two things real quick. And then uh, we have a fundraiser we do. Uh, and that is in February. And it's the 24-hour mega stream event. We have at least eight channels participating. Under Dark Uprising is the name of it this year. And it's for cool. St. Jude, Benefit St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We raised $2,500 yeah. last year. We're looking to do four or five grand this year with all the channels. 
Uh, there you can see that's got Anna's little spin on that as well as far as uh, graphics. Uh, and it'll be Friday and Saturday, uh, February 19th and 20th. And uh, at least uh, eight channels may be more participating. And the big, big, big announcement is uh, Greyhawk. Uh, uh, Gary Kahn, Luke Gygax, has asked me to organize the entirety of our con that we did into Gary Kahn. And so we're going to have it in. Yeah. It's going to be nice. That's amazing. First, and it's called now, here's the official name, Virtual Greyhawk Adventures. We switched it three freaking times, and they're going, they said you can't switch it anymore. <laughs> yep. So we switch it three times. There you go. That's the name of it, Virtual Greyhawk at, Adventures. At Gary Con. Within Gary Con 13. And uh, details are coming for everyone who wants to participate, and I'll be in touch with everyone on that. So, uh, uh, and that's all I have tonight. Anna, what do you got going on? And then let's do this giveaway. Well, yeah, we, we, I, I need to plug again the, the, uh, the Southlands, Southlands for, for, for Cobalt Press, because that's where I've been the last, yeah, I basically, this has been a Midgard heavy year for me. I've been working on, and the last couple of months, I've been, been painstakingly updating the, the Southlands map and, and gone over the end, but I hand it over. That might be, a, be I don't know, that might be one little set of, of tweaks or two left, but most of that is done. So I will go from back from, from Southlands and Midgard into Greyhawk again for, for the for for November and December. And I'm actually starting my own campaign again. I haven't run a campaign for Excellent. three years. So I'm starting mm -hmm. that and that's in Southern Shieldlands. So I'm now doing uh, mapping uh, a thousand square miles of Southern Shield lands and it's mapped in five feet per pixel resolution oh, good and it's grief. the new generation of of, uh, of mapping so it's a test case wow. for mapping an area basically so you can done, run dungeon camp style gaming but overland and and so so they will can be a test imagine? that is coming in december and january and february to all my patrons and on my website and it's also a technology that i'm because i used the greyhawk as the test case for because I, i'm not bound by deadlines and stuff like that and and it, so i can work on it for months and tweak the technology this so is something that i've been working on <clears throat> how to do rivers properly and how to do all the stuff really properly in detail and now i've figured it out and the software has gotten better and the computers got better so now is the time to do it and it's something that this technology can be used for other products hint 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 in the future so to speak <laughs> so, so so it's coming as the first test case and then that will come out so there will be village maps there will be be uh, uh, detailed maps of of the areas and i will also throw in the adventure material that i do a little bit for it as an example of taking one empty green hex from the Darlene map and then detail it, so to speak, as, a, as an idea of what you can do uh, to develop your own campaign. It's campaign. like and the also, deep space probe uh, uh, astronomy yeah, like thing the where they do a little area, yeah, they yeah, blow yeah, it up. Yeah, on, you know, it's yeah, like crazy. Into I know. Something. So it's, and it's something that we can start doing iconic locations. So, so the next one coming next spring is Lendor Isles. Oh, it's wow. a tribute to Len. Yeah, and beautiful. because I got yes. Len's sketches and we have a lot of, I've, I've talked to Len and we have a lot of information so we can actually do them the way Len envisioned the islands with the stuff in place as he envisioned it as much as possible. Yeah. And so that's wow. the next big sp springs, big project, so to speak, that is coming. So, so that's what I'm, I'm up to. Yep. So, so uh, Wolfgang, uh, someone in the audience just said, well, you said you want to play on my table. I'm open, the invite's open anytime. Maybe we'll get a game. I'll get Eric, uh, Eric Moe on the plane, and you're more that than welcome to fantastic. join in on yeah. that. Cool. Yeah. Cool. We have a lot of fun. Uh, you know, and uh, yep. people in the audience love Anna, so they save her. With We have a hero point system. <laughs> well, yeah, they cheers. give hero points to me. Otherwise, so, I would have yeah, been died were. and disappeared in long yeah. time ago. So, my characters uh, would die. They, 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 bailed, they bailed the party out last night, too, yep. at last second. They bailed so. me out. Yeah, so, yeah. All right, let's do those giveaways. What, we, what do you think here? Let's see who the winner is for this. Uh, and the first drawing person will be, now hopefully, uh, once again, I'm using Streamlabs here and nothing bad happens here. Let me get this all set up. Last call, if you want to sign up. Um, Wolfgang, thank you very much for doing this. I'm assuming we'll just give me the code. I'll send, I'll forward it to the right person, and they'll, uh, sure. they'll take care of it. And here we go. Let's uh, let's close this out here. All right, entries are closed. All righty. Len lives on. David, I agree 100. percent He'll always live on. And uh, hopefully, uh, Anna has some more, getting some more notes. Here we go. Ready for the winner for this? Yeah. This is for the Empire of the Ghouls hardcover book. And the winner is Grumpy765. That's a new name. You got to be on, man. You got to be on to claim this. 
I'm, making, I'm sticking to my guns on this one. Mm. I don't see him on. I do not no. see him on. We may be re-pulling someone, and there's a lot. There's uh, there's 140 people on right now, and I don't see him on. Uh, we'll give him 10 seconds. Anyone else? Grumpy, grumpy, grumpy. All right, look at that. His loss is everyone else's game, his or hers, I should <laughs> say. Uh, uh, repicking. It's sad, but here we go. New winner. Yep. Big. I know Big Al four one one six is on. I saw that person. Big Alf, you on? Big Alf. Oh my gosh, what is this? He bailed too Big soon. Alf is on. It's showing him in the list. So. Yep. So he might. It's showing him in the list. Oh my yep. gosh. All right. Uh, well, there you are. Yep, you got yeah, it, Big Alf. You won perfect. it. All right. Awesome. So uh, give me your give me your email address so I can send that to you. All right. Now let's do these. You get your choice. Whoever wants to do first pick. All right. First pick for these, and I will directly ship these to you. Next winner is Captain Mymore for regular on Captain. Uh, just tell me which one you want. Second winner is Steven Strategy. He just won something a couple weeks ago. That's great. So they're both on. All right, so Captain, which one do you want? Captain, you pick which one you want. Do you want Hamlet or do you want uh, um, do you want Bone Hill? And then uh, Steven Strategy gets the other one. I want it. All right, just let me know. And thank you all. I got to write that down because my brain is a sieve in these days, right? All right, Steven Strategy. And the winner of it was um, Big Elf. Okay, thank you all. Thank you so very much, uh, Wolfgang. That was wonderful. Wonderful discussion. Thank you so wonderful much. discussion. Great time here. Thanks, yeah. guys. Uh, yeah. Look forward to uh, what you uh, bring out, your company brings out in the future, and some yeah. other. You know, discussions. It may be a really, really fun game uh, down the road. Um, you know, yes. I, yes. I always something crank out have, something so, yep. intrigue in Greyhawk mm -hmm. and uh, with a one e two e miniature style. So, uh, and it's always a blast. So, that all right, we're great. gonna raid. Uh, who are we gonna raid tonight? I don't. Um, who are we gonna raid? Yeah, who are we gonna raid? Yeah. Who are we gonna raid? Let's raid. Uh, oh, Nerd Balchery's on. All right, we're gonna raid. We're gonna raid. He lives like ten miles from me, and he does a lot of miniatures too. We're gonna raid uh, Tony at Nerd Balchery. Sound good? Um, see you Tuesday night. Wow, what a busy week it's gonna be. Let me tell you. Yeah. Um, and look, I even have an exit screen now. Let's just hit this up, Miniature Building Authority, one of our sponsors. See you Tuesday night for Sean Reynolds' uh, game. All right, setting the rate up. Oh, we got 160 people on now. Crazy, crazy night. Thank you all. Raid, raid coming. The wonders of Twitch, right, uh, Wolfgang? <laughs> it really is great. Oh I love man. It. Just all right. learning it. Oh, if you need any help or any have any questions, uh, you know, uh, myself, Carlos Lacing. There's a lot of uh, Greyhawk streamers that uh, sure. can always uh, give you some uh, pointers there. I got a couple folks helping, but you know, maybe we'll have you as a guest sometime. Oh, I would and, love that. I would. I'd be. Yeah. I'd be honored to come on. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, if you have a talk show, I'd be uh, honored to uh, uh, give. We my, have a uh, chat uh, show on Wednesdays at noon, yeah. and I know Anna. If you haven't heard from somebody already, somebody wants to talk maps on a Wednesday. Okay we'll then. Talk I'll, I'll too. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Games, Wednesday yep. at noon. I could probably, especially over the holidays. Yeah. I'm, I'm not working the entire month of December. Uh, I got all this time I got to use. Oh, so. fantastic. Yeah, right. I'd, I'd be more than happy to come on. Uh, we have Legends and Laura at 8 o'clock Eastern on Wednesday nights. That wouldn't conflict at all. So, uh, right. Yeah, right. That'd, that'd be well, awesome. I'm sorry for my late start. No, it's I okay. Go it was great. great yeah. I got to go discussion. run for dinner. So. Have a great night. Okay. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you both. Right. See you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. That was awesome. Yeah, that was fantastic. So much fun. Yeah. Cranked it out there. So. Yeah. We came just in time before we got too deep into something before that we had to, to yeah. So hopefully, um, see you all. If you're on this channel right now, everyone have a great night. <laughs>